Let's get close, but not so close. For a time, you can shade her from a distance. For a time, you know we want to see each other. You have to stay in your own time space while we talk. <laughs> Radiation, isotope, fission, fusion, pile, radioactivity, neutron, gamma rays, solar power, transistor, automation. A new language has come into currency. To the public, it is a language of the future. To the scientist, a language of the present. This, then, is a report on our present future. Some of it profound, some of it mere gadgetry. Welcome to uh, Quarantine. And that black and white footage was not our new opening, but it was a science documentary from the mid-1950s at a time when the world was entering a new era of science, a new set of existential threats, and the public was learning about how all of this might work and, and how its political leaders might manage it. Um, and that's going to frame today's conversation. Welcome to Quarantine. I'm Peter Hirschberg. And today, in a moment, we're going to uh, rerun one of our most popular shows. It was a conversation with Steve Jurvetson, who was the first money in Tesla, SpaceX, and Hotmail, and our friend Andrew Hessel, who was one of the nation's, the world's top synthetic biologists. Uh, and Andrew's going to join me in a moment for an update and a conversation on all of this. And the other thing we're recognizing today this week, is that this is the 75th anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb. It's actually the 75th anniversary this week of the test of the atomic bomb. We're in that 75 years ago, this moment of interregnum after uh, it was tested, and when President Truman and a handful of people understood there was an existential threat, and before the world found out about it on August 6th. And and we're going to kind of compare that to now. Um, I'm going to bring in our two guests who we're going to hear from later who are rejoining us today, Andrew Hessel and Steve Jurvetson. Welcome, guys. Welcome. How are hey. you? Welcome back. Uh, hey. I, I, Peter, before you go on, I, I am not one of the world's top synthetic biologists. I am probably <laughs> one of the world's biggest communicators about synthetic biology because I love this stuff. No, uh, what he meant I, is you're the most synthetic <laughs> Of the biologists. Of the biologists. Yeah. Well, that's probably pretty close considering it's already, you know, wine time here up here in Sonoma. <laughs> but. Well, okay, that's all right. Hi, Steve. How are you? Hello. <laughs> hey. um, I wanted to frame today's conference. First of all, thank you guys for coming yeah. back. We spoke it was maybe six weeks ago, but but we're living in a moment of accelerated science, both in terms of how uh, discoveries are going, but also in our nation's odd reaction to it. This seems to be yeah. a week in which science is fighting the administration. Um, I'm just wondering if you, you, you know, and science is, you, you, we'll talk about World War II in a moment, that was the start of big science. Uh, what are your guys' reflections on the state of science as, as an investment in, 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 in the U.S. and what we think about uh, kind of this slightly anti-scientific moment and, and you know, is this something that's going on more in the private sector? But you guys must have some thoughts on this very strange couple of weeks we've been through. Hmm. Mm. Well, <laughs> I don't know, you want to start, Andrew? I, uh, it's, it's a tricky situation. The, the, here's what looms large in my mind as, an, as a VC or as an investor. Um, we've never really looked to government to guide science policy. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. Uh, DARPA and IARPA, and they do great work. But we can't rely on that, right? Yeah. We can't say, oh, if that goes up or down by 10%, it affects our business anyway, because we have to look for businesses that are starting yeah. and they may or may not have any, any government connection. In fact, some of the best ones tend not to have any government connection. So the related part, the part that really jumps out and resonates for me is a broader concern, not particularly unique to this administration or any particular political uh, assemblage. And that is this growing rift between those who understand and 
sort of believe in the scientific method, the process yep. of accumulating knowledge over time as a better method than any known alternative. And those who are into their own objective, uh, personal truth, right? Like yep. what I believe is as valid as objective truth. And that, that schism is disturbing how quickly we can backpedal on that. Where I thought, you know, five, 10 years ago that the long arc of human history is towards increased rationality, uh, a better method of learning. Uh, almost like saying over thousands of years, the humans comport themselves more humanely. Do we have a system of laws and policies that, you know, lead to greater ha human happiness and flourishing or, or are we backsliding? And that is a bigger area of worry. And because if there's, if everyone's truth is a personal truth, no progress is made. You yep. can't have progress without accumulated learning on an edifice of prior knowledge. So if, if you don't have a method like the scientific method working under the covers, you just slip right back into barbarism as easily as anything else. So and I'll you know, end this, it there. This, um, this moment of sorting out the science of COVID is, I think, particularly heinous for that because we're watching the scientific method at work day by day where there's a hypothesis it's untested. It comes out in a paper that's not yet journal approved. There's another mm -hmm. hypothesis. And to the public, it just, it does feel like, if you want to believe that, a bunch of irresponsible people making shit up when in fact it's the very tight <laughs> shot of the scientific process. Yeah. yeah. And people believe what they want to believe. I know plenty of folks who are like, I want this to be the case. Therefore, I'm going to believe it. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's so much information to pick and choose from today. Uh, the science you know, frankly, of this, uh, of the, of the stuff that's getting more awareness today, whether it's virology or immunology, uh, drug development, vaccine development, um, you know, these things are all complex in and of themselves. And, and so in a noisy environment with unfamiliar material, uh, you just get a lot of people kind of lost in trusting their instincts and our instincts tend to you know, make us want to run away or, or really just kind of go inward, um, you know, rather than, rather than open our minds. It's, it's get away from the danger. So whatever we find comfort in today, wherever we find that we can trust the information, that's kind of where we are as a group. But science is the only, I describe it as a consensual belief system. Yeah. Uh, a religion uh, is, is slightly different. Um, <laughs> but you know we have a we have a framework for how things work in science that you can test, which is and measure, which is probably the strong the closest we get to to real truth. Um, it is really depressing to see uh, the you know given that this is complex information, but it's all got a grounding in science. It, it's it's unfortunate to see the the distance now between the consensus truths that we have. You know, as noisy as it is in the newest information, and and kind of the the social and political and uh, machinery of the world, um, I, I actually think it's been a good time economically because clearly the systems that we have today need rebuilding and revisioning, and that's always opportunity. Um, you know, wherever the money comes from, but but there's a there's a pr it's until people see it and believe it and understand it and have it in their hands. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a really noisy environment getting through the rest of COVID, yeah. if you not saw, the next that. 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you, not to get too political, but you saw the amazing statement from the podium at the White House yesterday. I no, didn't it, it, see it personally. No. Why don't you paraphrase? That, <laughs> let's not let science get in the way of reopening our schools, was the exact statement that uh, the press secretary made. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's possible she made it because uh, she was just reading briefing notes. And since she had to switch to a page and read something quickly, it was misstated. But that is what came out. Before we move on, let's let's go back um, 75 years. Steve, you have a wonderful collection on the history of science and the space era. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing looking stuff. So I want to share with you this. This is the uh, press release that was oh. written. Uh, this is the press release that announced the product launch of the atomic bomb. Um, it was one of the more important product launches in history um, on August 6, 1945. So if you think about it, in the months before that, Henry Stinson, the Secretary of War, realized that in addition to actually using this product, he was going to have to explain it to people. And so he commandeered the head of public relations from AT&T, who was arguably the nation's best tech PR person at the time, 
swore under secrecy and said, you have to do the launch kit for this product, which basically meant writing the press release and who to acknowledge and stuff, which was kept secret till August 6th. The problem was they had to stick into one or two brief paragraphs uh, what atomic energy was, hmm. that um, the U.S. and the British had sorted out how to figure the harness the power of the sun, that we had built a product around this that was equal to about uh, whatever it was, 10, several thousand B-29 bombers, that it was not only capable of ending a city, but yesterday we had ended a city in Japan. And that wasn't really the real problem at all. That was kind of settled. The real problem was if there wasn't international control of this thing, the world might end. And that's what the U.S. had to do next, which if you think about it, Steve, that's even more to stick in in a press release than a Tesla. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. really, there's more than a tweet. Yes. More than a tweet. It was more than a tweet. And so this was, was the, get the timing right. You're saying this was the first test, but you mentioned the destruction of okay, a so, Japanese so seven, town. So this was after Hiroshima. So 75 years ago yesterday, the first plutonium device in history was tested in Alamogordo, New Mexico, July 5th, July 16th. Gotcha. Um, there were two atomic bombs, a, a, a uranium gun that they pretty certain would work, and a plutonium implosion bomb that was pretty hydromechanically complex because you had to compress the plutonium and make it work, and no one knew. But it worked. And this was very important because at that very moment, President Truman was in Yalta with Stalin. And if he knew the bomb worked, we had an edge in the Cold War for what came next. It gave mm. him more kahunas. And remember, he was a brand new president, and he kind of felt a little inadequate next to these two guys, Stalin and Churchill. So the atomic bomb gave him some votes. Okay, so <laughs> it was tested 75 years ago. That's surreal. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then immediately they knew it would be used in Japan mm -hmm. in, in a couple of weeks. And the scientists who developed this thing thinking that Hitler was going to use it on us, by the time it was developed, they knew nobody was going to use it on us. And the scientists were trying to suggest maybe we shouldn't use it because morally was it a good thing to start with. So that's kind of where we were 75 years ago. Meanwhile. Um, basically only two people in the world of journalism or press or that great thing that Andrew does explaining to us, two people knew. William Lawrence from um, the New York Times, who'd been covering this secretly, and the head of PR for at and to write the press release. So the press release was getting ready to go. On August 6th, a few hours after the bomb was dropped in Japan, President Truman had to announce it. And so remember, when this is announced, all at once, we go from, I don't know, a few people understanding in the public that there's nuclear weapons, and uh, nuclear energy, and someone might have split a uranium atom, to all of a sudden, the realization literally in a few days that the universe changed. And if you actually look at the op-eds that weekend, by that weekend, mm -hmm. the op-eds, everyone was saying, this changes everything, this changes international cooperation, we have to work together, it's an existential threat. The, the paradigm shift that happens, everybody mind, happened really suddenly. Okay, here's that press release, which this is this is a piece of wire copy that ran in the AP. It's go, and so this was written by the government. The United States unleashed the most terrible weapon ever used in the history of warfare, comma, the atomic bomb, carrying the destructive power equal to 20,000 tons of TNT. President Truman made the announcement that the American and British scientists had unlocked the power of the atom and produced the atomic bomb. The president said that the first atomic bomb had been dropped on the Japanese army base of Hiroshima some 16 hours before. That one bomb alone carried a more violent wallop than 2,000 super forts carrying old type TNT bombs and capable of ending a city. The atomic bombs are being made at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and at a plant near Seattle. Special laboratories also were set up near Santa Fe, New Mexico to handle the technical problems. Only, only a handful of more than 65,000 plant workers knew what was going on in their plants, and many learned for the first time Monday the nature of the work they were doing. The atomic bomb was previewed by scientists and military authorities in the New Mexico desert on July 16th. So that would have been the beta test. Hey, the hey Peter, bomb, but one, one thing just to make sure you don't yeah. lose that. Like, one of your first lines was, did I hear that right? The military base of Hiroshima? Yes. Oh, yes. Not, it was not the city with civilians and women and children, though, no, the military base. That's right. There was quite mm -hmm. an effort 
to try to make this look like a military affair. And on a relative basis, there in fact was an army base there, uh, but they kind of glossed over that. Um, in fact, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, no, the, the press release says that. So like the, the yeah. American reader would oh, be like, yeah. oh, we bombed the, a military the, facility, um, yeah. you know, yeah. how appropriate. It, it also, by the way, we just stop here for a moment. Um, so there was a there was a very vigorous debate about whether it was a good idea to just use one of these. And a number of people were saying, shouldn't we just do a demonstration in Tokyo Harbor? Because at least that way, morally, we'd let them know what was coming. And the counter argument to that is if it didn't work, we'd look like idiots. And in any event, Truman was like, there was only enough plutonium for a couple of these. And, and he felt his responsibility was to get the war over, because don't forget, uh, there were a lot of thoughts that, 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 that we might lose even more casualties than we had so far if we invaded Japan. And there were arguments on either side about that, because maybe they were close to losing. But definitely, it was tried to be perceived as a nuclear weapon. And also at that time, they really underperceived the fallout effects. They they knew that they knew that there was going to be a bunch of alpha radiation. They completely or more or less mixed how much of the ground would be sucked up, polluted, fall back down, and be bad for years. And not only was this not particularly good for Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but in New Mexico, where the bomb was tested, there was an enormous amount of cancers that started years later, and they haven't mm. been compensated yet. In, in fact, there's a whole movement of New Mexico to try to get them to pay attention to them. Uh, but there was a lot of naivete back then. So to finish wow. up on our press release uh, here, before we move <laughs> on, uh, the test bomb was set off from a steel tower. The explosion sent a huge ball of fire, many times brighter than the midday sun, billowing skyward. It set off a blast which rattled windows more than 250 miles away. A steel tower used in the test was vaporized, a huge open crater was left where the test tower stood. Uh, men outside the uh, men outside the control uh, tower, more than five miles away, were knocked off of their feet by the pressure waves. Forest rangers, more than 150 miles away, thought there had been earthquakes. President Truman had clearly indicated that the scientists who have made the atomic bomb have done two things: one, they have created a monster which could wipe out civilization. And two, some protection against the monster must be found before the secret is given to the world, said the president. Under present circumstances, it is not intended to divulge the technical details of this to anyone else. And then the president goes on to uh, call for international control of this uh, because the people who basically handed this to Truman said, OK, we've ended the city. We'll help you end the war. you got to figure out what to do about this. Well, wow. um, That was 75 years ago. Um, oh. Right. And it was, look, <laughs> the, the, so here, here's another question before we go on. And a lot of people talk about the search for a viral cure as a new Manhattan Project. Although the Manhattan Project was a secret project that happened in largely one location with one great group of scientists. And today we have open source, we have digital, we have CRISPR, we're distributed. So it, it feels like the pace at which science can happen, particularly with the digital and synthetic biology tools we have, is very different, which is the thing that should give us hope. Yeah, this is a transitional time. Like, uh, I want to be clear. Uh, from my, my worldview through synthetic biology and people like me that are interested in just programming biology, this is an amazing time because the only reason why we're even talking about a vaccine uh, today, like, you know, four some odd months, five months into this, uh, <laughs> uh, is really because synthetic biology has made it possible to even get to phase three trials in six months. Um, we can now, so this is, this is an incredible time for the entire industry of, or, and, and not just industry, because this is more than that. Uh, for people, whatever they do, to get primed to the power of biology, number one, and to synthetic biology, which is essentially using biology as a, as a human technology. Um, wow. So, so 
this is no, in my mind, not much different than the press release you just read. Like suddenly the world has just had not an atomic weapon uh, kind of rise up in awareness, but an atomic scale weapon. Like this little particle created a biological chain reaction that just shut down the world. And, and now we're trying to figure out, well, how do we put in, you know, how do we control this? As you were reading the press release, I was wondering if one, you know, I was writing this fit work of fiction where, you know, someone comes along and says, coronavirus was mine. I made it. Uh, like, here is the design. Here is the synthesis records and notes. You know, here's the orders I placed that are all verifiable. Here's how I assembled it. And here's how I released it. Here's how I modeled it because we have modeling software for this type of thing. And, and they just said, I'm trying to demonstrate to you how powerful this technology is. It is universal. We can't take it back. It's, we can't make an arms control treaty here. It's already universal. Mm -hmm. um, use it, learn how to deal with this and, and grow as a, as a species. Like if someone wrote that and released it, it would be kind of the same thing as that press release. It would only have to be a couple of pages and hyperlinks, but it would change the world. Well, we don't have that right now. All we have is our guesswork and, and to move beyond this, uh, this virus outbreak and deal with all future virus outbreaks, we have to grow and, and change our foundations. Uh, just like we had to change our structures around the atomic bomb, how we had to change our structures around the internet. This is this is a big shift. We, you know, by the ahead. way, isn't it interesting as a thought experiment just to to further that some more? Do we need it to have been purposefully made for it to teach its lesson? No. Right? So if we think of <laughs> it's an act of purposeful bioterrorism, that's one thing. But nature and concentrated animal production and the way in which we you know, expose ourselves to risks gave us this little wake up call, perhaps, or it came out sure. of the lab. Take, yeah, take your yeah. theory du jour, right? Yeah. In both cases, it should be a wake up call. It's remarkably benign as biopathogens go, right? Yeah. Remember, a billion people died from smallpox collectively. It's, it's in, yeah. embodied within the Hindu religion. Shatala Ma is named after the god of smallpox. So like, this is like a pea shooter of, yeah. uh, of pathogens. Right, and you're exactly right that this capacity to create such a thing is now in the hands of individuals, not nation states. Individuals, and uh, yeah. that that genie's out of the bottle. And so I think you're exactly right. I think society will have to cut its teeth on what when you might broadly call a societal immune system. How will we deal with, sense, detect, respond? How will we choose to comport ourselves and live our lives when we all could be as gods, and when we all could destroy? And frankly, the act of destruction and the, the, the generalized force of entropy here is strong, right? This, yeah. The force is strong with this one. The potential to do harm vastly exceeds our potential to understand and, and course correct. And that is a wonderfully destabilizing, and back to the Cold War, you know, when you have certain protocols that say we should launch first, we should have a hair trigger alert because that's gonna be safer than responding second, that's inherently destabilizing. There are certain Defensive modalities and offensive modalities, then we're out of whack. The whole system is going to spiral out of control. And we are unfortunately on the cusp of one of these. And so, you know, so, I think so long Steve. before robots or AI or any of these other things test our metal, and they will in the exact same vectors, we're yeah. going to cut our teeth on bioweaponry long before sure. we do any of those others. Well, Steve, my, my talking point on this is that biology is always at war. It's eat or be mm -hmm. eaten. The wars mm -hmm. don't have big explosions or anything, but they do have some fangs. But, um, Right, you know, by the way, half of all bacteria on Earth, this is an interesting thought experiment, subterranean bacteria, half of all of them on Earth are killed every single day by phage. Yeah. Like, like that's a no, huge like, amount the, of biomass. Yeah, yeah in the oceans, yeah. underground, like the, yeah. the phage uh, bacterial cycles are, are uh, just stunning in their, yeah. in their complexity and speed. But that's a separate issue. Given, given what you know about synthetic biology, and you're one of the first investors in this field, you, you clearly know it. Given that what you see happening and how quickly scientists are, you know, individual scientists, small groups, every country is now able to do some really remarkable work 
because of the tools and technologies and genomics and improvements in cell biology, et cetera, that, that we're all piling on this research project that we call coronavirus and the associated mm -hmm. yeah. and the associated immunology diseases, et cetera. Um, uh, where, where, do you, where do you rebuild? Where do you start to create a new foundation? Because right now, my sense is science is not getting really a lot of credit right now because it's spaghetti at a wall. We're seeing how, how, how the, we don't have a common architecture to work together like the, mm. uh, like the engineers that are building a cell phone or an airplane or a rocket. Like we don't have that engineering foundation where we can even timeline work, coordinate assigned jobs and really leverage the power of, of thousands or even millions of people in a coordinated way. Like it's really spaghetti. That's why there's something like 160 different vaccine projects. Um, like it's nuts. And just not tooting my, hone, my horn here or anything, but I have one of the smallest biotechs in the world but we make synthetic viruses and because our cancer fighting virus work was shut down because of COVID, we, our chief scientist said, well, let's make a vaccine because we have a company because it cost yeah. us something like $200 in DNA synthesis to reprogram our virus to be a vaccine. Like, like, wow, I'm surprised there's not 10,000 virus engineering or vaccine and projects right now but clearly the, yep. it's just this regulatory bar. How do we rebuild the system so thousands or millions of people can pile on, learn biology, learn the understanding, separate science from noise and participate, fund the projects that they think are interesting, invest in the ones that they think are smart, but overall see a timeline that, you know, is we're all working on the same, uh, on the same Gantt sheet, so to speak. Like that'd be so cool. So that's where I've been thinking these last four or five months as I'm watching this stuff go, realize we've got some of the world's best genome engineers in the world that, are, that want to help, but we don't even have a foundation to plug them in on. Um, whoever builds that builds the new biological internet. <laughs> and it's gonna be, it's gonna be re or not, maybe not biological, but it's a mm -hmm. biological internet that will, you can build you know, pharma companies on, do research on, do education on, um, you know, model and simulate far better than we get today. And more than that, the the bits, the, like the record keeping is all done. It's, it's got an evolutionary history that's kind of built into the foundations of it. Like, that's what I want right now. I don't want a vaccine. I, I do. I do. I want hundreds of vaccines that are all proven safe and effective and brought to market tomorrow because there's people dying because they don't have a vaccine. And we've got some promising ones in, in phase three trials. Steve, this sounds like a <laughs> for a set of mm -hmm. standards or a set of kind of standard parts, how they work together, perhaps platforms. I think it just needs the right foundation, Peter. Sorry to interrupt, but, yeah. but all the internet and all of the creativity and expression of the internet comes down to the IP protocol like, you know, and reduced. Mm -hmm. It's how quickly can we move those packets around? Where can we send them? The arch like, But it, it's all built on that. So I want an IP architecture for life science. You know, like yeah. whether you and there, go there have been go some yeah. predicate uh, efforts with Biobricks and iGEM and some others who, who've had some of the same dream. I think some of that is a longer term structural and foundational layer that as we fundamentally change biological sciences to be an information science. It, uh, as you mentioned, all the powers accrue, the simulation capabilities, uh, the ability to have you know, precise and personalized medicine. You know, I think the whole field of you know, RNA therapies are a wonderful venue along this line um, uh, versus small molecule design. Uh, I think we're going to eventually get there. I think we're in a, a, a as I mentioned earlier though, a, an awkward adolescent phase as a society where our destructive capabilities exceed our regenerative capabilities because of the complex systems of our biology. So a concern I have is this information problem more broadly that we're facing with pandemics, it, to me is one of early detection, having early warning systems uh, through a variety of ways to detect a, any novel pathogen, be it genetically modified or, um, or just novel, and have a societal response that is quicker than we saw before, right? That to me seems like the only near-term solution. It's an information problem to systemic pandemic. Um, just rippling, you know, like many have predicted this is gonna be the golden ages of, of viruses and pathogens in general. And there's very little in terms of policy protocol 
to differentiate, oh, this looks like it's a new nasty one, you know, let's immediately, you know, shut down uh, air traffic and what have you for the long-term benefit. So, you know, it begs questions of world government. It begs questions of governance. It begs gov uh, questions of transparency and privacy. It runs afoul of many liberties to imagine doing this right on a global scale. Um, so that's going to lead to a lot of political debate and football tossing down the field um, because no one's going to want to tackle that directly. And so I think, unfortunately, it's going to take hopefully some entrepreneur out there to figure out a business driven reason why you would do this anyway. Um, I, I think the reason's yeah. already here, Steve, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, mm. Like, I think that the the best of the WHO and twist biosciences, DNA synthesis and, and Merck for vaccine development mm -hmm. um, and whatever company does detection today, there's not that many, but, but I think the best of that can get put on chips and built into a device no bigger than a smoke alarm that you'd have in your home, mm -hmm. um, like Nest. So I think there's like, there's like a, uh, the, it's internet connected, always communicating, always sensing. Right. But is, um, I mean, and it, there is work on the sensor. It's the sensor thing that you're talking about that we most oh, need. Of course, but, but yeah. more than that, a sen so a sensor that could detect a novel virus the first time it entered your home or your car mm -hmm. or the airplane or the airport, it doesn't, mm -hmm. there's many different scales, of course. Every building we make today, in, in the West has a smoke detector. It's easy to mandate virus de uh, bio detection everywhere. Um, it, 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 but more than that, you might have a, just an injector of an EpiPen in your pocket that's a pharmaceutical company. It, it can literally upload the instructions for and manufacture a vaccine just for you in any amount, like in, in minutes. And right. that's not science fiction either. So the combination of that sensing and distributed action sure. Yeah. is yeah. is a one two punch for any infectious mm -hmm. disease but yes. it's, it's it, but of course to get to that reality which is completely possible mm -hmm. we have to jump through this fear and concern that biology is a weapon um because everyone has learned about viruses through the diseases they've caused not how what amazing you know biological entities they are and how they're kind of responsible for us being here um they kind of gloss over all that and just say, no, the, this virus is right. dangerous. That virus is dangerous. Like, I truly love viruses. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's um, uh, that world it's is cracking true. over. But once we cross that, it's amazing, Peter. Like, we get global health, like, super cheap. Like, how much did your last cold cost you? And, and you know, with, a, with an infrastructure that is not political and, and immediately responsive, like, it's it's... It's a, it's a personal, it's an extended immune system for everybody. And the picture you paint is one of that's highly distributed, that there's sensors yeah. everywhere. So you pick it up it's, very early. It's like, it's like your cell phone. Honestly, yeah. your sensor, your cell phone can be all of those sensors as well, uh, as well as the manufacturing plant. So and just you can imagine the, the response, both the, yeah. the political response or the don't go outside response, but also the technological response is distributed. Yeah, your, your cell phone is going yeah. to protect you more and more. Today, it's it's contact tracing. The fact that they're still training paper-based yeah. contract tracers is nuts. Yeah. It, like, it's nuts. But, you know, but your cell phone is your contact trace. Your cell phone is also your doctor in many cases. More and more, you just communicate with your doctor. And as we start putting more biosensors yeah. on that phone, it's going to become, you know, not only your best doctor in terms of prescribing a treatment it'll become the best doctor in terms of diagnostics no question and and yeah. like because it knows where you are at all periods of mm -hmm. times who you've come into contact with yeah. the the forces you know of just your like it, it's the answer so I, think you just painted, I think you brilliantly just painted the picture of how we get from here to there right it's not a government mandate it's not a hey let's go put fax machine equivalents you know these big bulky last generation technology boxes everywhere it it's a literally better will iphone come, right it's a better and, iphone and, and, and the way i think we get there will be through regular health meaning your phone today with the sensors it has today can be the ai cloud service agent for yeah. home healthcare right Describe your symptoms verbally for the illiterates and people. So it's 100% usable by everyone. The AI yeah. gives you the recommendation. Okay, you do have a serious condition or, hey, stop doing that or eat this, you know, supplement uh, or take two aspirin and call me in the morning. And that gateway to free healthcare forever, I think, is the gateway to free sensors forever because epidemiology, adverse effect tracing for drugs, everything that you'd want to do at scale to come through this data channel. And every consumer would have an incentive because, as you said, it would be the best healthcare provision that we've ever had. Right, because it'll have the most data, and it, it's it's just an information problem. 
So yep. that I think is what unlocks value. I think that'll take a good five to 10 years to play out um, simply because it'll take some time to build AI, get it you know, deployed, but it could deploy on existing smartphones ubiquitously um, on the health side. And then if you describe symptoms yep. that sound a lot like some new pathogen, well, you know, that could be used for contact tracing and epidemiology as well. But I, I, this virus is perfect to nucleate that shift. Yeah. And, and because so many people just have access to no support, you know, um, this is a real ray of, uh, of hope because everyone, like, I, I've, I've been working with SynBioAfrica the last few months. Uh, and again, SynBioAfrica is like the synthetic biology communities that I've been working with everywhere, except they're in Africa. So they just don't have the same level of resources and tools available to them that we take for granted over here or in Europe. And, and so I figure, well, everything, you know, everything that works for them will work pretty much everywhere. And it's been an incredible lesson. I, I, of course, they all have cell phones. They all have communication today. Like that's not the issue. So I already know if this, if we can make the cell phones start working for them and with them and build an economy on, on that, uh, new biological architecture, you know, low level, um, it's going to make a massive difference uh, because it'll scale everywhere. And Steve, you point out how um, this is a wake up call. And is it enough or should we have responded earlier? And I think of both Larry Brilliant's warning and Bill Gates's warning that said, mm -hmm. look, it's all about an early warning system and a response system. And yep. perhaps what we're learning is given, and I think this is your point, given how politics work and how resources work, we weren't quite ready to do that fast enough and at scale and cheap enough. And so they had the right, they had the right solution, but we weren't technologically or politically will-wise ready. And it'll take another 10x or 100x of reduction of cost and speeding of things up to make that just be part of things, part of the landscape. Mm -hmm. I think we could have. It was, you know, on its way. It was being built, and then it was shut down just a few months before uh, Corona broke out. Yeah. Don't we really need some sort of atomic regulatory commission? Like, isn't that what we're talking about? Like this, the, the, it's like, yes, having some sort of early warning and response system is what we did even in atomic weapons to kind of mitigate well, the, the threat. The, the slight difference is you have a, a material that you can restrict access to. No one needs plutonium in the course of normal business. And here it's so tightly coupled to the economy that you would... Yeah. Inevitably, what would you regulate? Would you not allow oil synthesis? Would you not allow? No, 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 no. I, I think there needs to be very just. Uh, um, look, I figure if we can make open source software work, we can make open source biological software work. Uh, the, it's it's just what lessons can we take from our history with dangerous substances that need to be controlled, uh, and and some of the digital versions of that that we have today. Where you know how do you how do you literally put paint some lines on the internet and where do you paint them, um, and and take the best of that and kind of move it to the world of of biology, because people that are the, the technology itself of of bioengineering is agnostic. It's it's yeah. always human intention. Like uh, so, but we we, we know that most ninety nine point nine percent of people won't screw you. It, it, but that, but it's but it just uh, takes one crazy guy. Yeah. It just takes one crazy guy today. And so, how do you build? So, how do you and build I, 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 yeah. I think the open source analogy is interesting, but may give a false co uh, comfort in that, yeah. yes, uh, open source software can be robust and, in fact, more resilient to attack than engineered code, right? In the old sort of cathedral model. Yeah. But so are viruses, of course, you know, software viruses. And what's interesting is if you think about bio warfare, there's a difference, in my opinion, between defensive and offensive modalities. That if you're building a bio defense system, let's say for our computer systems and our public infrastructure and dams and what have you, you might want to make that open source and welcome all attacks and have you know bounties for anyone to figure out a way through. And that's right. great for defenses. Yeah. But when you're doing a offensive weapon, which the U.S. does and China does and Russia does as well, yeah. you don't want anyone to know what you're doing because the moment it's out there in public, you may not be able to exploit that quite as well, right? You don't want everyone to have your offensive modality. You don't, you, do, you just, you basically run with it for as long as you can. And this has all kinds of weird implications on it going underground that the least, the less people that know about what you're doing, the better. Uh, it's really bizarre how the social uh, things unfold from that and unpack from that. And so tying it to bioweapons, 
you could have everything you say, robust defensive modalities, figuring out how to boost, bolster our immune system, externalizing the immune system, doing all kinds of great work in the open and make it public, and it would be better for that reason. Nevertheless, you could have underground offensive efforts going on that are just as powerful as ever and would not be part of that system and don't need to be to be effective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I get that. Um, I, I guess I, I always expect that element to be there. Um, I just, uh, I'm always looking at how to minimize that risk. <laughs> so, oh yeah, no, I'm with you. I, I yeah. want to minimize no, it. It's, yeah. it's really, it's really <laughs> important to think about. Yeah. 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 This our most recent, by the way, our most recent investment is exactly that, that in a way for biology, an externalized immune system, printing human lymph nodes to rapidly generate antibodies yeah. to any infectious agent. Uh, so we're trying, but that doesn't make me an optimist that this solves the problem, right? Like we need that and we need early detection. I'm I'm taking a different approach right now, Steve. Um, if if you don't mind, I'm I'm I, I you know again I'm I'm chair of the Genome Project, right? Where we have these amazing uh, top of the world scientists that are thinking about how to go and build genomes, and their problems I rec I recognize um, is is just their peer group is just too small. <laughs> uh, but but down on so I'm I'm taking this approach now where I'm just trying to put a new foundation in at the very bottom of the SynBio period. Uh, uh, pyramid, pardon me, um, where we can essentially invite everyone in and in a, to a digital world that allows them to build real things, but in a closed system. Um, and I, I think it's, I, I think that's going to be part of how you, you train the next generation to properly think about the offensive and defensive uh, landscape that we've got here today. I think you just have to educate as many people as possible. I, I, I take some solace that the, the networks that we've built that are global, whether it's the internet we're talking on or the tool we're talking on or Facebook, um, the, these, these, these networks that we've made digitally that are global seem to work pretty well. Um, and even though they, they have the potential for failure points, we, we're all so invested in making them work that, that they, they thrive, even though they clearly have probably bigger vulnerabilities than biology. Um, biology is pretty tough, <laughs> but it's hard to take down. And, and no, at yeah. the small end, biology it's easy enough continue. to program. Yeah. Biology will continue to inherit the earth no matter yeah. what we do. Humans, exactly. another question. Humans, we would like to be part of the ride. We have this sort of yeah. selfish sense of supremacy that we should be along for the ride. Um, and hopefully we will. But here's the two things that I want. I want it easy for people to learn a hello world of, of synthetic biology. Like just literally go online and be able to quickly use a system that allows them to build a real living creature. Um, and and, and, and as, a, as, a, as a simple experiment, you can do just by sitting down and taking an interest. And when you say people, like hello world are we program. talking like uh, middle school, high school students? And well, like well, no, I'm talking kids. anyone, anyone from eight years old to 108. Like, it, it's just uh, someone sits down and says, I want to learn the basics. Well, if you try and do that with a computer program, you learn how to do hello world and just display hello world. It's, it's actually pretty cool. And for me, the hello world of biology is an E. coli bacterium that's glowing, like it's glowing. If it blinks, that's hello, super cool world, right? Like it just the fact that it glows. So that's, a, that's an experiment that I have seen eight-year-old kids do. But yeah. if you digitize that process and now you can actually do it, you learn how to use the tool, access the system and build a, a bacterium that glows and you get to see the result. You don't need a lab for this. It can all be done with robots. There was uh, a cool it, uh, eye gem one. They, they had a whole biofilm yeah. of E. coli and when exposed to light, it would mm -hmm. do some sort of trend, uh, promoter would change and you'd have some luciferase you know, release and glow. Yeah. So what it effectively was, was an E. coli roid. You know, E. coli. Oh, yeah. right. oh, oh, they right. made, they made, uh, they've yeah. been playing with E. coli for so long. We've got a veritable, we've turned it into a disco ball. Like it is literally the biological display. You can make it blink. Mm -hmm. You can make it communicate with other E. coli. You can, uh, if a certain switch is activated in the E. coli, it changes color. So we've, we're, we're hacking E. coli like it's an Arduino. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, and, and today we're, we're pretty much at the level we can simulate that cell. And, mm -hmm. and just like you can get an Arduino simulator or an iPhone simulator. So, so we're at that point. So I'm building that with some of my, uh, former Autodesk colleagues. 
uh, and friends to go and put in this low level, simu not just simulator, you can simulate it in the sandbox, but then you can go and build it in biology. And, and it's all digital, so it's super cheap and run by robots. So it's, it's Do you not imagine like this becomes broadly popular the way that uh, maker tools and 3D printers became oh, part God, of- Oh, God, yeah. Like yeah. I, I didn't say, but my company in New York, which is actually building synthetic viruses for cancer, the CEO comes from the 3D printing world. Yeah. That's that's the knowledge that you need today to be a biologist. It's remember a cell is the most powerful 3D printer. That's it. Yeah, you you send code to it, it it either becomes that thing or it makes that thing. Do and, we even answer if, if this kind of stuff gets disseminated and comes into our schools, we might reverse the anti-science bit? Oh yeah, absolutely. That, sure. The, you know, after Sputnik, but, when there was that challenge. America got with the program and pushed more science. And so one of the, I mean, this is important for mm -hmm. our, our soft power national leadership and just like not being a bunch of idiots is, can we build that up somehow uh, and perhaps use this as a moment for that? I absolutely believe it. Mm -hmm. I think it's essential, not just for America, but for everyone to plug into this, Yeah, like everyone. And so that's why I think it, we have to kind of have this universal thinking and just make it an open platform. But, but here's the cool thing. iGEM's done all the hard work in kind of planting the seeds. This international genetically engineered machines competition mm -hmm. that has been absolutely instrumental in getting synthetic biology seeded around the world. Because it, it was hard. You needed wet bench. You needed training. You need mentorship. They, they kind of got us through this hard part where now, it's, now the whole system can be digitized. So basically imagine an iGEM program for the world where you actually get to go and design and build biology and do a competition. And most of this can be done today virtually. You can still have a physical competition, but you can also just have a contract research lab that receives the programs, prints out the thing, and, and, you know, and basically the competition is just in the, is in the measurement. You can have like the, the first competitions. Uh, but you don't need a stadium. You need basically a bioprinting lab and an assay. <laughs> but you were you were both mentioning that during the COVID crisis, uh, some of your companies reprogrammed themselves to go after the virus. I'd love to hear yeah. a little bit more about that. And was that when you say funding was cut off? That's just because the market moved. No, 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 funding was not cut off. off. No, no, clinical no, trials wasn't cut off. were yeah. cut off. Well, and we were we weren't in human clinical trials. We were just doing most clinical trials. But the most clinical trials were all shut down. And and so all the work that, you know, you work on really short timelines when you're a SynBio company because you, you know, any any startup is lucky to have 18 months in funding, right? So so you really work on compressed timescales. Uh, but, you know, so we had everything really timelined out to, to get through our, our milestones. COVID just kind of blew that up. But the, the good point, we were able to stay open by designing a COVID vaccine, we were essential. Um, so that our staff had no problem moving around the city, um, and and we made we made a vaccine candidate. It's up on our blog. Like uh, it, it's it blows my mind because I'm not there day to day. I'm just trusting, you know, the company to these amazing people <laughs> that you know are going to be better synthetic biologists than uh, than I will ever be. But but the the amazing thing is here, the stuff that we're doing is really accessible to everyone now. It's just the foundation isn't. And so let's, uh, I've just been working on building a new foundation. And Steve, uh, what were the experiences yeah. of the, of your portfolio companies? In yeah, so there are two jumped to mind. Um, one called Prelis Bio here in the, in the Bay Area, they 3D print organs, human organs. So the idea is, you know, uh, lung, kidney, what have you over time to uh, help with, you know, the shortage of transplant uh, organs. And what they realized in, in the current environment and, you know, we're doing clinical trials with humans for anything other than COVID is problematic. Um, is that what is one of the simplest, smallest organs we could print was a lymph node. So they make huge arrays of um, externalized immune systems, basically human lymph nodes. And what they demonstrated already is that you can present uh, the spike protein or the entire coronavirus and uh, generate the antibody response within a little lymph node the way it does in your body, which is the B cell, T cell interaction across the membrane and self amplification is the same because it's from a human built uh, ex vivo. And they can, within a single month, get from a pathogen like that particular virus to the antibodies. And they've already, this will soon be coming out, show that they generate the exact same antibodies that are used through sick patients and convalescent serum and a much longer term process with much more sampling. They did it with their very first patient, very first attempt. They can then 
do this to any new pathogen, including mutations of coronavirus. So as it, it whether it's going to be the D614G mutation or others that worry us, we can be like, well, let's make new antibodies for the new one. That's one. So in short, what did they do? They said, we can print organs. Let's do lymph nodes. Let's make antibodies. The second one is a company called Sensei Bio, S-E-N-S-E-I. And they also do cancer vaccines using phage display. So they program a bacteriophage. This is a, I'm thinking of it like a lunar lander shaped thing that infects a bacteria and makes the bacteria produce on its surface all the proteins that it might want to express. And they program that to, in this case, not be a cancer vaccine, but to produce the antigens that you'd want to respond to in uh, making a vaccine for coronavirus. What's beautiful about this approach is, as we've been talking about earlier, these phage do a wonderful job attacking bacteria. They're like a biological manufacturing system. But even better, like a subtle detail, is the phage itself is a virus. It's pretty harmless to us, but it's a virus, enough of one, that it's its own adjuvant. Because in any vaccine, you need to have you know, the thing that <laughs> triggers the immune system and, and then like, hey, I'm a virus, watch out, like you should kill me. And so the combination of the phage and the phage display uh, creates a wonderful vaccine. So that, that's very early though. Uh, that's nowhere near ready for market. It's uh, uh, very promising though. Uh, so that was, you know, stepping back. Some of the companies in the life sciences domain are like twirling their thumbs if they're, you know, at the stage of clinical trials, wondering, you know, when and how can we keep going if we're not quote essential business, um, which is ironic and sad that, you know, curing disease would not be considered essential business, but, you know, a bar and a hairdresser would. Um, but that's the way it is both in the US and Europe. So, you know, that's how a couple responded. Wow. Uh, by the way, uh, a, a phage is just a virus, but only for bacteria. And, mm -hmm. and, but they're the same machinery. By the way, yeah. I recommend this crazy book. Uh, I found <laughs> he has it. at his side. <laughs> I, it, well, I'm, I'm, my, I'm taking over the office. I had to, ex the, the garage as a new office. I had to expand. Um, there you go. But, but yeah, it's uh, it, it, working, phage just changed my life. I, I, this, in my undergrad days, I, I, I worked in a stock center where I grew up phage and and bacterial cells and and completely changed my view of life science. It was one, when you freeze dry, uh, you can freeze dry E. coli and, and turn it into a powder like instant coffee, like we have, like we do with our yeast. And then when you add water, it boots up again. It, it works really well. It's good for so when life. you. So when you realize that yeast and, and E. coli are some of the most complex and widely used cells in the world, and we can turn them off by freeze drying and turn them on by adding water, that kind of changes your lens of biology from day one. And then when you start realizing that these viruses, they're just wild. They come, uh, we used to have this library of over a hundred different phage that we, because we were a stock center. And it was just like, these things are so cool. Plus they're easy to grow. You just give them some, some more cells to go chew on. But uh, like, I think, I think that's where we are now. And that's what I, that's where I see all the, where, where right now we can start doing really powerful molecular biology using E. coli and, and phage, e, bacteriophage to teach the next generation of biological engineers. It's the same process, whether you're making a, whether you're working with a phage and E. coli as you might be working uh, with, with an adenovirus and, and a human cell. It's the same ideas and mechanisms and control systems. So as you start to demonstrate this on a cellular level, I think you'll see new therapies come up through that approach. But yeah, biomanufacturing, uh, everywhere. The, 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 the using these types of ultra high throughput assays and sensors, yes. Antibodies and, and organoids and other ways of doing testing without the whole animal, just like we today can get, you know, burgers without cows. Awesome. <laughs> Big fan of that. Yeah. What's the range of time frames for these? When we were on last, and in fact, on the segment, which we'll run in a moment. I was going to say, I, 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 I have missed my 420 peace out time. So we're going to send you off. Up. Yeah. One final question, <laughs> and we're going to get rid of you and okay. show the last segment. What's the, what's the range of time frames? of these companies that we're talking about, whether it's uh, manufactured uh, uh, beef because you're duplicating the, mm -hmm. the, the, the meat process or some of these uh, phage things, you know, because you're putting investors work to money. What's the range of times for these to go commercial and have these developments? Well, but for regulatory paths, right, which is dramatically changes the answer, a lot of them will be ready this year. The meat will be in manufacturing this year, and that one actually should be fine for uh, early sampling. There's ways to get to market um, in restaurants and what have you without requiring a, a complex FDA cycle. Uh, a vaccine will be the hardest, you know, for reasons probably most of your listeners already know. 
uh, you don't want to give somebody who's healthy something that might hurt them. And so you have to do incredibly detailed safety tests. And we don't yet have a simulator of the human body. So we don't yet have a way to predict other than trial and error experimentation, uh, whether you're you know safe and efficacious. So that unfortunately makes that very difficult on the other so ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Steve, thanks for dropping by. Uh, yeah. By sure. the way, so everybody knows we are gonna, we're about to play a rerun of the conversation we had a few weeks ago, and we just said, Same hey, we're drop by, but we've got <laughs> practically a whole new show. So thanks for your time, Steve. Sure. And, Absolutely. Uh, Thank we'll you. See you soon. And, and Andrew, what's the book? Show us the virus book we want to tell our oh, audience. Oh, this was a book that someone pointed out to me, um, and, and so I got it the other day. It's called Viruses More Friend Than Foes, than Foes by Karen Molling, a, a German scientist. And, and it, it's a delightful read, I have to say. This is... This is, um, there's some really amazing ideas in here and background knowledge. It's not the easiest to follow, but it's uh, because it's, it's not that type of a book. It's not a textbook. It is more of a manifesto in some ways, uh, but I love it. So lots of good ideas here. As like, we... again, again, the, the, so much of the world here, number one, was blind to biology, had this neural blind spot to the, uh, look, we don't wake up in the morning thinking, hey, let's, how am I made? Uh, why am I alive? You know, how much longer do I have? What are my odds of getting cancer? Like, we, we don't think that way. It's uh, the way I tend to describe it is we have uh, a blind spot in the back of our eye where, where yeah, our optic it's... nerve connects yeah. and, and it's patched over by neural software. I, I truly believe that there's a patch on, the, on our minds that prevent us from being overly curious about how we tick particularly at a molecular level. Like the immune system is pretty strong in most people. But then people like myself that are bio geeks and kind of dive into the guts of the thing, we, we recognize, eh, you know, it's not that different than computers and programming and any other technology. Uh, you just, once you get familiar with it, you can start to manipulate it. And, so, and so, but that's, that's the great tension. Yeah, it's yeah. like if I, if I give a kid a computer and my two year old has an iPad, like, like, and it's amazing to watch them navigate their world. It's like, we, we, we don't look at that as being dangerous in any way. Well, some people would like they're, they, they tell well, me I think that there's two things here. One is, one is that we think it's dangerous. <laughs> and the other is, I think, as you point out, um, we don't have experience with it. So it's more mysterious, you know, yeah. nobody, I, I know, think, like nobody today would argue that like an internal combustion engine's a myth or we don't have fuels that create fire because we've had that for a while. And, yeah. you know, in the eighties, when computers became popular, like what was software and where did that fit? And, or even in the early internet, like why would you want to put video on? Well, we've become comfortable with it. This, this gets back to what we were saying earlier, because people are so unfamiliar both with how these things work and the fear of it, um, and the fact that we're looking at the scientific method every week, argue with itself and sort stuff out. It's almost the yeah. perfect storm for myth making and disinformation. We may be at the absolute uh, apogee of, of, of just mystery and misinformation in science because we have this pathogen and we've not yet popularized and understood mm. these new techniques. Oh, I, you know, it's, well, of course not, but who would be interested, honestly? Like the way I describe it is my friends and I, we're the folks that studied biochemistry and cell biology and genetics and, and all the other cocktail party conversation killers. Like, it, it's just like, th these are, we're, we study stuff that most people, it just doesn't matter in their lives. So it's really hard to engage people in stuff like that. The, the, and it's different, like with, so I usually describe what I do as exploring inner space. I'm, I'm trying to get down into the machinery of life and, and understand how does it work. And I realize like an airplane, uh, a cell has, has literally tens of thousands of different distinct components and, and it's all in dynamic action. It's not like a machine with 10,000 components that you just put together and it stays as a machine. This, is, this, this whole thing is fluid. And, and, but it's not, but it's basically programmable. And, and so we've gotten to the point now where we can uh, read the whole program 
uh, that's that's not, but it's not easy enough to do. Let me put it this way. Uh, the, we need a sequence anything company where I can just swab anything or pick that stuff up at the back of the fridge that's really getting gross. Uh, whatever, uh, take a cutting from a garden, collect a mushroom. I should be able to just drop that in a package and send it somewhere and they'll, they'll completely genetically analyze it and send me info about it. Like, we don't have that yet. And, and someone please out there, go build it. And today you've uh, stretched our imaginations because yeah. when you understand that what you really need is the earliest possible detection, which means at the nano level and sensors everywhere, oh, there's yeah. the virus, catch it off. Because now it's like no one knows when the thing actually started in Here, China or whatever or who had Peter, it where. And Peter, we were, I get it. Yeah. Uh, like so so here's the thing we could build a smoke detector for coronavirus tomorrow like it's it's just not that hard you put sensors on a chip and and literally you could have you could do it tomorrow you could it could be your new iphone case your coronavirus sensor if you come anywhere near a particle it just detects it like it needs a certain threshold clearly but but that's just engineering has anyone made like, a good demo video of what this would look like? It's kind of like the it, it, look. It, it'll be a chip. Look, no, but here, the no, no, but, but yeah, but but just think of what's happening on a molecular level here. Yeah. First of all, we have this ability now to make ant synthetic antibodies. Yeah. It's a protein, so you can design and build antibodies effortlessly today, and companies do, and and then you have the ability to make a chip, which is basically a landing yeah. pad, a connection. You could make a chip with a, an, a, mil, a million addressable elements tomorrow. Let's just keep it a thousand addressable elements, easy. And to each one, you put in a different antibody for a virus. And, and literally now you have a direct connection to that antibody. If that virus hits it, it it's, it's, going to, it, it's going to send a signal and tell you, oh, coronavirus. Like if it's all coronavirus antibodies, you'll actually get you know statistics. But Anyway, that like we have the ability to do that. Why why doesn't it just appear, you know, in three months, uh, you know, rather than you know all these 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 liquid you know, these, these cell phones are rapid assets. There's seven billion of us. Are there there are billion? more. There are more cell phones than people, and we're not talking, you know, internet connected devices, which is now growing explosively, right? So, here, so, here's so what, what yeah. you're suggesting here is, uh, you know, we talk about the internet is being the most powerful computer on earth, the most powerful computer on earth might be 7 billion biodetecting real-time uh, devices that just yep. push to the edge and understand stuff backed up by then synthetic laboratory things that take the stuff on very early. And, and what we've suggested here, it, it, this is bringing us back to the atomic bomb, if that was the high watermark of big centralized science, there's no way this is big and centralized. You've made the case this is highly distributed and fast yep. and lots of little simple things talking to each other. Like yeah, you like your cell phone will end all, all pandemic. Right. Okay, listen, on that, I'm going to let you go. And now I want to remind everybody that uh, this is quarantine. It is now 5.02 Pacific quarantine. And we are now going to go to the reason we are here, to the episode we, sh we did with you and Steve a couple of weeks ago, where we actually went in depth on, on some of the economics, some of the companies here. Uh, and, and initially, this was just going to be a five-minute intro, but y'all are so interesting. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it, it's so rare that you get to have a half hour or 40 minutes of Steve's time. And, and Peter, yeah. you are the ultimate, you know, bridge builder. So, By the way, did you see Dr. Fauci yesterday with Mark Zuckerberg? I uh, know, but it's uh, that's what I'm watching tonight. <laughs> okay, this, I just want to say this was brilliant. So the president of the United States is basically telling uh, Fauci, uh, you, you, you can't go on TV. And so when ABC and CBS call him up and say, we want to talk to Fauci, the government says he's too busy. And, and, but, but, but he is allowed to go on blogs. So, so Zuckerberg brings him on Facebook because he has a blog and he wants to put him on his page, spends an hour with him going into great detail on stuff, of course, pushes it to everybody on Facebook and CBS and CNN stream the damn thing live. <laughs> so this is the ultimate media hack. And here's Zuckerberg oh, who's trying, to get more, trying to get a little more credibility now because he's been under a lot of fire. CBS and CNN would never take a one-hour feed from Facebook unless 
the president of the United States made the best content impossible for them to get. And that's what that's why you should look at this thing tonight. Um, oh, wow. F fantastic. Thank you. We will also post here for your and our audience's delight from 1967, Walter Cronkite's documentary, The 21st Century, in which he explores the mysteries of life and speculates on where we'll be today. So we'll, we'll bring that up. We love history around here. And with that, thank you, Andrew and Omid. Now let us run from the not so distant past, about a few weeks ago, our conversation with Andrew and with Steve and Mickey and myself. And then Mickey will join me back here next week. Andrew, have a great weekend and audience for your Friday evening delight. More of this. Let's take a look at it. show is really going to be focused on what is going to get built and what the landscape looks like with two of the best technologists in the world, actually three of the best technologists in the world, because joining me is my co-host, Mickey McManus. Welcome, Mick. Hey, Peter. How you doing? I'm doing great. Look, the microphones are working. The headphones are working. We've made it Some this far. Working. Okay. Yeah, this should be fun. I mean, I think I'm just happy to be a, a bit of a sidekick for you, Peter. So I think this will be Interesting. Uh, by the way, we do we are uh, streaming this on a bunch of sites, so Twitch, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn Live, and we also have the the Miro, the infinite whiteboard that we're just experimenting with. Um, Omid, can you pull up the whiteboard for a second? Um, just to give you a sense, this is today. We're we're going to be talking to to Steve and and Andrew, um, but if we were to pull back, we'd kind of be able to see. Um, the sessions that we had last week and the sessions that we had the week before and the conversations. And our hope is in a future episode to use this as kind of a collaborative uh, whiteboard where everybody's working together on a particular uh, challenge or problem framing uh, effort. And, and we'll talk more about that later, but I just wanted to give a little overview. Back to you, Peter. That's right. Um, okay, well, let's, I, we should just ask Steve to join us because we could spend uh, all afternoon and more with Steve. Steve, welcome. And let's and and, and make it also. Uh, well, you know, uh, one of the interesting questions here that I'd love to ask you is: is in the in the venture world, as you're looking at all of this, what what has changed as you've looked at things in the last couple of months, and what is this reinforcing? Uh, because uh, uh, you know that shows up both in terms of I assume investment theses, but also you're working with a bunch of startups. Uh, which all of a sudden have a very different world. Yeah. Um, coming off that cheery music we just heard, it reminded me sort of the Smiths, you know, like really g gay and light um, sort of melodies uh, for dark topics. But uh, in any case, uh, in some ways, uh, it's a good crisis pairs startup business back to its core essentials as opposed to changing it. In other words, it's almost as if when you have an abundance of capital and money comes too easily, the things get distorted into bizarre world, uh, the vision fund throwing money left and right and center, distorts reality as it should be. And pairing things back helps. So, you know, as I look back over the crashes economically um, that I've witnessed as a venture capitalist, the dot-com crash, the 2008 crash, um, those have been the best times to start companies. Uh, Tesla launched in the, the middle of the 2008 crash. Um, there have been great companies formed at this time. And the main, one of the main reasons is you can iterate with customers rather than chasing the next financing event. You know, instead of investors being important to your business model, it's your customers that are important to your business model. And uh, that's just a healthier way to build a business. You scale better, you iterate with customers, you build products people care about. So I actually love an environment where money is harder to come by versus abundant. And um, you can imagine that. If there's no evolutionary pressure, you just get a bunch of noise. So I mean, hence the title, you know, noise and winnowing, nuance from the noise. Um, one other point, you mentioned looking you know, back over the long arc of history and, um, I, there was a tabulation I first did in 2010, and I just updated it, or the Dow Jones Industrial Average Company, so those who have risen to at least that uh, moniker of being the top you know, companies in America. And um, the supermajority of them were founded during a recession or the Great Depression, which is kind of remarkable. Uh, people generally set out to and do see to build world-changing companies in down markets. And um, the... Uh, Sort of reasons I think that's maybe obvious beyond just the culture that you build, as I alluded to, or the financing environment, is that um, you, uh, you, I guess you could think of it just simply that what is the opposite of tumult, volatility, you know, crises slash 
disruption. What's the opposite is stasis, continuity, predictability, and in those environments, the big get bigger. And so in a very abstract way, the only way a new entrant has a chance is if something is disrupting business as usual. Otherwise, there would be no new entrants. And um, so we thrive on this, like a good financial crisis. You know, we know that black swan events are going to come more rapidly than ever before. And that's great for new entrants. And that's good for the world because new entrants lead all meaningful change. Um, uh, maybe I'll end it with that. But I mean, that's just the most you know, deeply held belief I have in business is that there are no exceptions to this rule. <laughs> yeah. You know, when, when we started talking yesterday, you know, I was suggesting, well, maybe a whole bunch of new theses are on the table. And in fact, when we were talking to, to, uh, to Tim Chang a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how, well, there's the whole work at home thing versus the downtown thing. Uh, mm -hmm. We see all this trolling of the internet, but now we're using the internet for more social purposes. But you were pointing out that your philosophy has been look out 50 years, ask, mm -hmm what's inevitable, but no one ever did, and then do it, which would suggest that that's almost like a longer term smoothing function. In other words, you look at things without these perturbations. And so I'm wondering, kind of from your perspective, what are the things that are reinforced and, and, what, mm. and what perhaps are you seeing that's new? Interesting. Let me, let me do some background thinking on your question. Yeah. The, um, because the first part of your preamble made me want to at least re you know, emphasize what you said, which is, if you look out 50 years, uh, and the reason I picked 50 is it's far enough in the future that it's very difficult to think how you get to any 50 year future from where you are today. In other words, chaining forward is actually a difficult to exercise given current regulatory environment. Pick anything, the FDA, autonomous vehicles, pick any drones, pick anything that seems like it's new and important. And if you say what's gonna happen over the next five years, good luck. Um, if you instead say what's the inevitable future 50 years from now, things become crystal clear. All vehicles will be electric, all of them, right? All vehicles will be autonomous all of them. Um, we won't kill animals for meat. We'll get to that later. But that was one of those epiphanies. It's like, of course, how could you imagine this? And if, by the way, if for a moment you doubt that that's the inevitable future 50 years from now, just make it 500 years. Ask yourself, will we be drilling oil out of the ground and burning it in little 20% efficiency engines to get around the planet 500 years from now? No, of course not. It's impossible for that future to be true. So it becomes a question of timing and you know, market entry and segments. So we'll get to that later. But this starting point of trying to invest in inevitable theses um, is pretty simple, frankly. It makes forecasting a lot easier if you just look so far in the future that you don't have to worry about the present. Um, so I don't know. Maybe some people perceive that as hard, um, but I, I actually think it's quite a, quite a bit easier. So when you ask what's the same and what's different, you're right on one regard, which is as I look at our existing portfolio, the companies we, by the way, I started a new venture fund about a year ago with Mariana Senko from DFJ. Two of us started this fund. So I think about, when I talk about our portfolio, I'm talking about the new one. We have invested in 15 companies. And when COVID rolled around, we looked at them and we're like, you know, we're not really sure at first blush this affects any of them um, because they're so far out in their dreams and aspirations, whether it's nuclear fusion or boring or neural link, it's not like they're gonna stop. And the metaphor, or not metaphor, the analogy I like to use is that if you look at Moore's law over 120 years, the abstraction of Moore's law, which is just how much computation can a dollar buy, um, which is my favorite graph of all time, uh, it doesn't have any perturbations from recessions, you know, the Great Depression, World War I, World War II. It continues unabated. And symbolically what that means to me as a reminder is scientists don't rest during recessions. Inventors don't stop inventing, technology doesn't abate their humanity's capacity to compute continues uninterrupted over 120 years and so we just count on that right and count on that for forecasting and uh any company that's doing deep tech really crazy things are going to take a few years to get to market in a sense other than work at home there isn't much that's disrupting their world right now 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 i say that with with some caveats there's certainly disruptions but it's not like uh, the restaurant industry or you know um, anything in the you know, in the Virgin, you know, I feel for poor Richard Branson, everything in his portfolio is almost like the, uh, the opposite, right? Things that are dramatically impacted by that. So um, the things that have changed, of course, is there's, and we can get into this maybe in follow-up questions if you'd like, there's a lot of new opportunities get created. Um, the work at home mandate, the need for edge intelligence, the uh, need for autonomous vehicles, the push in China, especially for uh, getting off public transit, interestingly, at least for a period of time. Uh, and, and then a broad category, of disruptions to the supply chain. So companies and countries, countries like Singapore and companies like every company that manufactures something, um, have realized some surprise they, they may not have thought about before, like systemic risk. Um, and we'll get to the meat industry later, but like that's a gr perfect example. It's like you thought you had 10,000 suppliers 
oh my, look what can happen when you have a pandemic um, um, you know, at, the, at the animal host level uh, across your entire supply chain. You, you, the level of systemic risk is huge. And so uh, a drive towards alternatives, sustainable alternatives, plant-based alternatives, what have you, um, or in the case of vehicles, you know, personal electric two-wheelers in China just exploded after the last SARS outbreak, the last coronavirus scare in China, where there are now 200 million of these vehicles in China. And just pause to let that magnitude sink in. There are more electric vehicle drivers in China than there are drivers in America. And it's largely due to SARS. <laughs> when I say largely due to, it may have happened on a slower trajectory and reached perhaps almost as high as it is today, but it certainly has accelerated. After years of regulation, policy, directives, trying to encourage this. SARS happens and boom, it just, it just takes off. It's like, I'm mean, gonna show you a graph later, it's, it's mind boggling. And uh, this time around, the same thing's happening. So subway ridership in China, which has amazing subways, is down 40% year over year, even after reopening. And uh, people move to personal transport. Um, now, luckily, some of these electric autonomous vehicles can actually be more efficient than public transportation. Uh, in certain cases, and that's good news. So it's not like this is a, a retrograde move. It's sort of accelerating move to the future. Um, but let me just back up. Country, countries like Singapore and others that face supply chain sh shocks are like, oh my God, we've got to like fi figure out a better way so we're not like totally taken out by the next one. So Singapore is investing actively in nuclear fusion, for example, multiple companies. And, uh, and then the meat industry, of course, is looking for alternatives in their supply chain. So they're not facing systemic risk. Um let me ask a, su a supply qu chain question there. I was on a call the other day with one of the global consulting firms and they did one of these things where a bunch of people are brainstorming and putting up stickies. And it was one pessimistic meeting. And one of the key pessimistic points was, well, the US and China are gonna kind of devolve into nationalism and then supply chains, which have been optimized for just in time and cost are gonna become, because they have to be resilient and duplicative, expensive, then there's less R&D because everyone's doing the same thing. And so the world will be worse because we're going to be doing much more local manufacturing and therefore less R&D and as a percentage less efficient. Uh, and I was sitting there thinking, well, I, I, I'm not certain of that. And then I felt like the weird guy on the West Coast. So I just thought I'd ask you, when you hear talk like that about, you know, OK, we're going to we need more resilient supply chains and we may not, may not all be on boats. Does that signal to you rapid inefficiency or lots of opportunity? And then how do you resolve the fact that if you in fact duplicate things, it won't just be more expensive? Yeah, good point. So you could, in many cases, you can see this uh, crisis, if you want to call it that, this, this a shock to the system as an activation energy to get you over a hump, hopefully to a better place. It is possible that decentralized manufacturing of meat, indoor farming, uh, cellular agriculture, um, other physical goods instead of one mega factory consuming all a distributed set of manufacturing locally could have benefits. For example, uh, think of any manufacturing industry, having a local supply chain build, you know, reducing products in the same continent at a minimum as where your customer is involves a lot less transportation costs, right? a lot of less overseas ships. And in many of these businesses, the sheer inventory carrying cost of stuff in transit for, you know, work and process inventory is kill. It can kill you. And so there were, certain forces towards um, lowest cost labor globally for manufacturing and companies like Nike and others chasing that around the world as they kept moving to new locations and you know very inefficiently building entirely new manufacturing facilities in each of these new economies that they were going to you know, quote exploit starting with Shenzhen and then moving you know to you know, cheaper places or you could say hmm, might it be better to build more of this stuff robotically the way Nike and mo you know most new automotive plants would do so that if you're tethered to the past and a sort of sunk cost of an employment base and, and plant and equipment somewhere, yeah, it's hard, hard to make a change. But if you have to build new factories and new locations, doing so with the latest modern methods may actually get you to a much more efficient place on the far end. Um, by loose analogy, buying a new electric vehicle is much more efficient than buying a used gas burning car. And that used to be a debate where people used to think it was the other way around, that buying a used Prius is a better way to go than buying a brand new electric car. But it's actually, if you look at the total cost of ownership from an emissions point, from a sort of emissions in greenhouse gas perspective, it's better to buy a new electric vehicle. So just by analogy, a new modern robotic plant close to the customer may actually be globally more efficient than the mega factories of the past. You know, hey, um, wait, I want to jump in for a second. Yeah. Um, so Steve, you mentioned this sort of, it, it, it opens up this activation energy, right? People had been talking about more robotic manufacturing, more hyper-local, you know, recomposable micro factory things. But, you know, the economics didn't quite work out and, and, you know, it was all just in time and it was working. 
Um, and yet I, I saw a statistic that said 70% of the spare parts that are manufactured for cars are never used. That You have to make them the first time because the factory can't be rebooted back to like a 2016 Volvo in 10 years if you need a, if you need a part. Um, but if it's in the cloud and you just produce it locally, then the actual cost is not only the, the spare parts that you just had sunk cost for, you know, materials, but also keeping that, that warehouse warm and keeping everything else and all the supply chain risk. So it does seem like there's this opportunity to say, how do we have um, a little bit more hyper local or at least approximately, you know, just move weird things uh, far, but most local things probably can be a circular economy or we can look for other ways of actually kind of being a little bit more, uh, uh, more efficient in this. You also meant, I, I, so I just wanted to wrap that in there because mm-hmm. I think it matters, but you mentioned, you know, sort of forward chaining won't work. When, you, when you're trying to forward chain, you're, you know, from today to the five years from now to 10 years from now. But then you said, but if you actually go and see what's inevitable, backward chain. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that was a, a beautiful way of thinking of it. But you also told us the other day, you have sort of the what's inevitable in 50 years, but you also look for things you've never seen before, sort of right. things that just open your eyes. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on that, sure. that part of it? This is fascinating. It actually harkens back to something I learned back in when I was doing a master's in engineering is a course by Kathy Eisenhart, I remember, about, um, and she wrote a book, I think called Simple Rules or something. Basically, a most of, more of a systemic and process-based perspective on how innovation happens and how um, we make decisions in complex situations or how you could, uh, in a sense, build a good business uh, over time. And, and separately, we can get into this because there's all kinds of abstractions around this. A focus on process, not product. A focus on iterative learning. But one example is, what is this? And I, so it was only maybe four years into the venture business that I first thought of this. I, I was too busy learning the business to actually reflect on, is there a simple rule that defines how I choose one investment over another? And it was around the dot-com crash when I was completely losing any interest in everything.com. So every B2C, you know, consumer internet company, as they were called in the day, or B2B trading exchange, which was all the rage where all the money in theory was being made, they were all starting. And, and this was my trigger event, this, well, this epiphany, was when I got um, actually the fourth business plan in total for just selling pantyhose over the internet. Uh, gazelle.com got venture-backed, and there were three others on their heels, like just selling pantyhose? Like there's so many levels at which that's wrong to me. Uh, but I thought, am, am I going to have to sit through pitch meetings like this for the next year? So I switched completely uh, to what we now call hard tech and, you know, optical integrated circuits, quantum computing, um, molecular electronics, synthetic biology. Those, that's in the 2000 onwards. That's what I was investing in. So, but it was around that epiphany, around that insight that I realized, aha, what makes sense in retrospect as a rationalization for what I've been doing intuitively is that I've always tried to invest in something that's unlike anything I've seen before. Hmm yet adjacent to something I know a little about. So not just randomly go off and do real estate investing, then oil and gas, then distressed debt, because I don't know anything about any of those. But in a sense, and uh, adjacencies to past experiences. So I started, of course, what I studied in school as an electrical engineer by training, came in and having done a lot of software programming, you know, the internet and software and chips, that all made sense. That was you know, adjacent to what I'd studied, even though it wasn't squarely in the domain of my studies. Um, and when I pivoted to nanotech and molecular electronics, again, was in the electronics domain and, and then sort of opened my eyes to biology and synthetic biology over time. Make a long story short, through a series of adjacent frontier explorations, I've realized this is actually entirely what we should embrace in our new fund. My partner, Marana, agrees, luckily, that, organically on her own, that this is interesting on in so many levels. First, you naturally uh, explore the frontier of the unknown. You don't rest on your laurels and just keep investing in the same you know, genre of thing, whatever it is, enterprise software or something that after 10 years, really, it's going to be boring as hell, right, for an investor. Um, you are always renewing yourself. You can't um, get sort of complacent and lazy. You get portfolio diversification for free because you're not just loading up the boat with something that has systemic risk across your portfolio from an investor point of view. And um, almost by definition, you're going to places where most of the rest of the venture world isn't because there are no market studies to give you confidence. There's no warmth of the herd. Um, you 
you can make mistakes by the way, of course, and, you know, march off into a sector like VR or nanotech, but, you know, in my own case, uh, prematurely or in ways that just never are going to materialize to be as big as people thought initially. And so it's not like you can't fail. You absolutely can. But I think it's a lot easier than any other strategy I've seen people try to pursue, like just bold face competition in the warmth of the herd of, you know, the pick the hot area of venture capital and do that better. Do that smarter. Yeah, have a yeah. better network. Like, good luck. You know, it sounds about. boring too. Yeah, and it's also it's boring, right? Yeah. Like, I can. I know that I'll be just as excited ten years from now as I am today about my job because it'll be completely different. And mm. and I know that because I look back ten years, there's no way I would have been able to tell you the portfolio companies I've invested in. Like mm. almost none of them, except maybe AI, would have even been on my consideration set. Like synthetic meat, mm. nuclear fusion. Like no, 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 right? You wouldn't coming, have thought of that. Yeah, right. Especially coming off the dot com crashes, like semiconductors, software, and life sciences. That was it for the venture community. Like, mm. There was nothing else. I mean, you could invest in automotive, you'd lose your money. You could invest in anything else. You just like, no, like mm. none of that's a proven success area. And now it is so diverse, right? Every industry is opening itself up. This is a side thesis that, you know, to being re-engineered as a software uh, business. You, know. you mentioned the uh, edge computing devices or edge, you know, mm -hmm. devices with intelligence at the edges. Can you elaborate just a little bit more on that? What, what you're seeing or what you're excited about? Sure. So we've invested in four companies in this area, so full disclosure, chip companies, software security layer, so Mythic, Occam, Bridge AI, and Latent AI. And um, they are all looking at different parts of the stack, but, but I'll, so I'll talk about them in a generality, which is I believe that the major shift in computing right now that we're in the middle of is a move of intelligence to the edge. So rather than one just central brain or cloud service like an Alexa uh, you're know, responding by sending your voice signal up to the cloud, analyzing it, coming back down and taking some action locally and responding. Um, it's much better to do it locally for privacy reasons, for latency reasons, for network bandwidth reasons. You, you can't have an intelligent edge or the IoT, the Internet of Things, without collapsing the Internet and the cloud at the same time. It was actually, as an aside note, there's this wonderful analysis by Google that if, if everyone just started using, okay, Google, some ridiculously short amount of time a day, like I think a minute of continuous use somewhere during the or intermittent use somewhere in a day. If every one of their Android users did that, they would have to double the size of their data center. Oh. It's like it's <laughs> it's just it would collapse it. It's just way too much, even for Google data center. Right? So moving intelligence to the edge hasn't been done because of power and computational uh, limits and and cost of both. So cost per watt, cost per calculation, and dedicated silicon for neural networks from Mythic and others are cracking that nut. So imagine like a 40 cent chip the size of a button on your shirt that could do anything and everything that you that you need for let's say a home appliance as a thought experiment like any speaker independent thousand word vocabulary recognition or in a security camera recognize faces recognize your face right you know do all that work locally to minimize you know when you actually send uh, information up to the cloud on on an anomaly let's say or, or a person of interest in your field of view um, so for any device you can think of, but, cam but cameras are the easiest, I think, to, to think of as, a, as an example, uh, they would be better. Like my Nest cameras are horrible. I had to turn them off the first month I got them because th they weren't smart. They're just really dumb for a, a smart thermostat, well, really dumb, maybe not camera, really either. dumb. Yeah. Right. Oh, and they're not, I mean, they're the learning thermostat. Like, it, it's yeah. just complete and utter misdirect on, uh, on marketing. That's a nice thought, but they needed a lot. It's like saying I... I have an intelligent uh, pet, but I have ants. You know, like, uh, like they, you need a few more neurons to have an intelligent pet. Well, and I, it seems to me like if we say inevitable, um, we've got proof cases all around us. We've got solar powered things called trees right outside. <laughs> There's an awful lot of computation going on. You know, Pando, the the uh, the stand of Aspen in in Utah, has been around for seventy five thousand years, and it uses mycorrhizal networks to like get different things like carbon atoms from dying oak and water from areas of drought to abundance. It's been running pretty long. It's like a, an internet of trees and mm -hmm. it's got lots of computation and all those different things. And we call those life, you know, it's cells and bacteria and things like that. They all do little bits of computation. And it, it, it and I liked your point about privacy, right? If you could do it on the device, you could just send the, the metadata or the, the result mm -hmm. or something exactly. else and not be sharing, you know, that person's wearing this thing on this too, you know, whatever, but just sharing, Hey, yeah, there's someone there. Yeah, um, like when your Samsung TV was listening to you, it was a right. Crazy, <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the way, we might sell all your data to somebody about what you're doing on your couch, yeah. but we we don't know yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go, one, Peter. Sorry. <laughs> you know, there was one disruption that I was thinking about last week that sparked that we should have this conversation, mm. uh, which which was, um, you know, a couple of years ago we were talking and you were telling me about your investment in uh, meatless meat, and I'm thinking, well, that's interesting. animal animalless meat. 
Animalless meat, exactly. Yeah, motherless, cow, animalless, slaughterless. Yeah, the cow is a bad factory, and um, and I was, and at the time, I'm thinking, mm. why did he pick that one? Now, then, then we're sitting here last week, and the not only is the food chain disrupted, but then it turns out that meat factories are, are lousy to begin with. Plus, they spread pathogens. Plus, mm -hmm. uh, meat in general does. Plus, meat encroaching in 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 grazing lands does. And I'm thinking here, here's this whole thing that could lead to a transition and to give. So, and then I'm like, okay, that was a really interesting case of this. I wonder is what's causing what, so I want to call you, but two years ago, you and I were at South by Southwest. And this was the first time we had this conversation. I want to play a clip just because I think it's kind of fun to go back and okay. see what we were talking about then. So two years ago at South by Southwest, we were talking about blockchain in the finance world. And I said, I want to throw a lightning round at you. What's going to change? Omid, let's take a look at two years ago and two months ago from now. <laughs> Steve, it's time now for the lightning round. Oh. What's getting disrupted next? No, I, well, the one that jumps to mind is agriculture. Is it a trillion dollar industry or soon to be one? Is it growing or shrinking as a percentage of global GDP? And is it one, again, that hasn't faced a new entrant, let's say in a thousand years, in terms of how you grow meat? Uh, in particular. And so there are some really interesting technologies that are just now ripe for using synthetic biology precepts, basically, you know, induce pluripotent stem cells that then become skeletal muscle and you literally grow cow without the cow. You don't kill a single animal and you end up with steak and bacon and duck and chicken. I've tasted this stuff, but actually anyone, anyone who eats meat ever visited a slaughterhouse, I'm going to start asking. I don't eat meat No way. Wait, you, you eat meat though? I don't okay, know. are you in the meat industry? <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to hear afterwards why in the hell you would do this to yourself. Like, I, I don't think I could unsee it if I, if I went. <laughs> so, so here you brought us into synthetic biology, plus this interesting bit that we're not making the change for the moral reason. Oh, after it happens, we'll justify it. We were making the change because economically it was feasible. So I want you to walk through, like, the thinking on that, because that tells us a lot about how change happens in moments like this. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Um, I myself was a meat eater. Um, ate 25 pieces of bacon in a single sitting, had meat of some sort in every single meal of the day, three, three meals a day at least. Uh, could not conceive a meal without meat, so that's my starting point. Yet I rationally, weirdly, uh, had the simultaneous realization that this is unsustainable, that this can't be the future. Uh, 50 years from now, I just can't imagine China follows the U.S. as they come out of, you know, lower class rises the middle class, meat consumption goes up, it's like clockwork, that will destroy the planet. They'll destroy Africa the way we destroy the Amazon, right? So the vast majority of Amazonian deforestation is for American-grade beef in America, um, which actually comes from Central and South America. Um, so rationally, I knew that, but emotionally and morally and what have you, never sank in. Like, it just, I could not connect those dots. So even though I was looking for years, I, I stated a goal with all these arguments around land use, water use, what have you, they want to invest in an alternative that could scale. I didn't believe that the first few companies I saw uh, using 3D printing and what have you were really the way to make meat. Um, and so I actually posted on, on Facebook this complete thesis of why it needs to happen and such, but I didn't change my own behavior. Then, and there'll be an analogy to do the current shock to the system and supply chain in COVID, but when something forces you to not eat meat, you can look at it differently. And to me, it was a personal challenge to someone else. I wanted her to get stop smoking. She wanted, well, she didn't really care about me, but I said, hey, I'll give up, you know, eating meat for six months if you give up smoking for six months, thinking she'll quit if, you know, a lifelong habit if she can go six months. And, and that actually worked. She's no longer smoking. I'm no longer eating meat. But I thought I would. I thought I'd just go right back to it. And what I found happening in my own self is just a personal example of what I think happens for a lot of folks around cognitive dissonance of your personal choices, whether you're a smoker or a meat eater, is that you will not let it sink in at any level. You will avoid the articles in depth. You will not go to the slaughterhouse, of course. And the analogy I would use is um, uh, the sort of moral retrospection we do around things like slavery uh, back in the 1800s or, uh, or, or whale fishing, maybe as a simpler example. Um, just one little factoid that's amazing. Coming out of the 1800s, whale hunting was the fifth largest industry in America. Fifth largest, that's pretty freaking big. No one was saying it's immoral. Uh, they were depending on it for whale oil for you know lighting lanterns. When kerosene came around and we had the economic alternative to whale oil, it switched remarkably quickly, more rapidly in a transition than you would expect because the moral argument suddenly kicked into gear. Like, oh my God, let's take a look at what we do to those poor whales shooting harpoons through them. And the outrage and outlawing of whaling took place after the economic alternative was better. 
Same thing with slavery. You say, hey, you don't have to own the slaves that are working in your field as sharecroppers or on their feudal system or what have you. You can have your same land and have an economic system that works. And that argument was a bit more of a leap of faith. But once the alternative was there, like you know, capitalism works, you can actually farm your land as a landowner without slaves. You could have this transition. However, that transition occurred, when people change their behavior, the morality follows. So instead of saying, I woke up one day, and change the way I think about morals or ethics, and therefore change my behavior. That's what we think happens, but it's actually, I believe, in reverse. That um, you you are forced, perhaps in a in a pandemic, to change the way you act, and then you rethink the way you act. So let's say the meat shelves are empty at the local grocery store as they were for a while. There's a pork shortage in some part of the country, and you you only eat, can only eat the hot dogs and other crap meat that's there for so long. You eventually give that Beyond Burger a try or the Impossible Burger, and they're actually fantastically great, wonderful tasting products, you consider that in a way you might not otherwise. So you, you get flipped over to an experience good, like, wow, this is a great substitute. In this case, we're actually talking about a substitute that asks for some you know, potential trade-offs and taste and what have you. So it's not a perfect alternative. And so I think when the perfect alternatives come, in other words, just like the electric car is better than a gas burning car on every single metric, save one maybe until recently, um, these synthetic meats or lab-grown meats will be better on every single way. So it's not just oh yeah, it will cost less to manufacture because you're not throwing away the majority of the animal. Uh, it will be healthier. Uh, you could actually have omega-3 rich steak if you wanted, but let's just say to start, it's identical. It's just cleaner, there's no E. coli. You buy ground beef that's made in the lab, you don't have the GI tract and all that gross intestinal stuff to deal with because you're not growing the intestines and you're not feeling all the crap. So it just doesn't happen. You may have pathogens, but the shelf life's gonna be much longer. It's gonna, I mean, they've already shown that. So it's just cleaner, so it's cleaner, it tastes better, it's healthier, it's cheaper, and then, oh, by the way, you're not slaughtering animals. And that's when the majority of people will say, let's stop slaughtering animals. Right now, you have the forward-looking vegans and others who are, in some cases, militant about their point of view. A good friend of mine, Moby, the musician, has been that way for a long time. And there's a little bit of a disconnect in middle America where people like their meat, and they're gonna eat their meat, and they don't wanna hear from the vegetarians telling them they shouldn't eat their meat. I came from Texas, so I gotta like, channel the accent a little bit. Uh, just having a little flashback there. Um, I can't tell you, like I, I once ate four pounds of steak in a single sitting. Um, just, I was a meat eater. So um, I was having flashbacks now. So in any case, the, <laughs> I think the way you reach those people is by giving them an alternative. So in the current pandemic, interesting that when you had a supply chain disruption, people are forced to try something new and they realize it's better. Not and so bad. There you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Hey, we should uh, like explore this biologic thing a little bit further, yes. Peter. Yeah. Sure. We're going to bring, we'll bring Andrew Hessel in here because, okay, we've oh, gone yeah. down this meat factor and one thing is consumer taste meat alternatives, but at its core, we are talking about the ability to synthesize uh, organic matter and, and, and proteins from scratch. And that also brings us down the whole vector of being able to take digitized information like Andrew, the digitized COVID-19, and then speed up the ability to respond to that by synthesizing vaccines and perhaps then speeding that up to anticipate. And Andrew, when we talked to you in the very first show, you talked to us about your work in synthetic biology, which is kind of the great hope in the biologic century in terms of being able to come up with new things. So the first question is, hello, and how has your thinking and the world of life sciences changed in the eight or nine weeks since we talked at the top of this crisis? Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's great to be back. Um, what has changed? Um, one of the really important things for me is, um, is now there is a global awareness uh, of, of the power of biology over our lives. Like, it, it's funny because life is one of those things that you just don't really think about until, until it is disrupted in some way. You, you find a lump, you get a prognosis that isn't good, uh, you lose a friend, you get sick. Um, uh, I, it's been my experience that most people don't think about the architecture of life really at all, unless it's their profession. Um, and so the invisible world of single-celled organisms like bacteria and yeast and, and of viruses has largely been ignored by pretty much everyone. So part of my uh, part of my communications has been to educate people on 
on these simple organisms that are now becoming ex more and more accessible and manipulable with synthetic biology um, and trying to get people to think about the, the, the importance of these organisms in our life, in our world, in our food chains, but also think more about what needs to be done to prepare for a world where these are much easier to engineer. Uh, what type of applications should we be thinking of? How will it change things like agriculture and medicine and, uh, and, and just general health um, or food production? Uh, one of my favorites is just using yeast to make not meat, but to make milk. <laughs> That's been a, a really a real favorite and just and just laying this foundation out and getting people to think well also w How do you make the world thank you so much safe given that? Um, given that we are getting more ability capability to go and engineer these 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 organisms so what's changed for me is that lesson about the importance of these microorganisms particularly viruses um, the the need for for new systems to be able to engineer them, to be able to detect them, uh, you know what we think of as testing, to be able to, you know, to be able to quickly use them to make vaccines, and the entire process that uh, the regulatory regimes, etc. Uh, let's just say it's an easier lesson to teach right now because because we've got this this global disruption. And people are realizing, wow, there's there's been trillions of dollars um, uh, displaced um, in in terms of our economies. There's been incredible pain and suffering in in nations around the world. I don't have to teach that anymore. Now it's it's how do we come together to build a new system? That um, let me, let me ask a question. Let Let's start with kind of the present problem and then move forward. Um, the world has become aware that, as you told us last time, that the that the, the the genome of this virus reached our shores before it did, or perhaps at the same time, that this allowed people to start in on multiple vaccine paths at once. But it still takes a long time to do trials to figure out what works. We're not really simulating all of that yet. And then there's the whole manufacturing and supply chain stuff. So mm -hmm. it's a year, 18 months. And we know we're heading into a world where there'll be more disruption, more planetics, more unplanned unexpected stuff. Um, does that get better? Kind of wh what have we learned from this and what might we expect in the next five, 10 years uh, so that this doesn't just keep happening to us or doesn't well, keep happening to us? What we're learning is the power of genomics in general. And I usually look at genomics as, as a programming language. And so there's there's kind of reading the code, there's, there's understanding the program, uh, comprehending the code, and then there's writing the code, the actual programming. The thing that's been really remarkable about this virus and how quickly we've been able to respond to it is genomics has gotten so good in terms of reading code today that the that the sequence of this new virus that was causing pneumonias in China uh, and I was identified um, at the end of December 2019, that sequence was published to the world uh, on January 10th by the Chinese researchers. And, and that set off a, a, a flurry of activity in terms of making diagnostic tests, uh, synthesizing key proteins that can be used for things like generating vaccines, and even completely synthesizing the entire virus particle so it can be moved into labs and, um, and, and studied. Um, the speed at which that happened with this particular virus uh, is, is unprecedented. With the first SARS, it took over a year just to get the sequence here, it, it took 10 days. And with uh, one of my favorite papers that was published uh, last month, within within four days of that sequence being published, uh, a group in Switzerland was already synthesizing the entire virus genome so that they could reconstruct it and study it in the lab. Like that is, that's that's a remarkable acceleration. They, they were able to recreate the virus without receiving a physical sample from China in, in about a month. And, and within a, a week and a half, submit a paper to, to Nature, one of the top scientific journals. So that's remarkable, but it, it, it's still just opening the door. All the processes uh, for doing these types of studies, 
uh, as, as researchers, which are very granular and cellular, are, are, aren't completely uh, collaborative yet. Um, we, we, there were vaccine candidates made within a few weeks by companies like Moderna and others. There's a number of different strategies you can use for making these types of vaccines. Uh, but, but the process of testing them and demonstrating that they're safe and effective uh, again, it, it's well known. It can take a, a year, a year and a half, uh, really doing it rapidly. Uh, often it's much longer. And, and then just building up a body, a corpus of knowledge around a new, a new biological agent uh, takes a while. Um, and you see all the, how interconnected all of these systems are from researchers and data scientists and geneticists to, you know, you know the various groups that make vaccines all the way to uh, the hospital care centers and 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 your and your doctor's office. Uh, we're starting to see that the entire architecture is so fragmented and doesn't you know there's just it doesn't have a, a, a common base that well, I think I what will come out of this because I think change. that's the that's the interesting thing. It almost seems like there's a lot of people jumping on and going, I can do a vi I can do it. I can repurpose just the way the three D print world. You know, everybody with a home printer is saying I can make a a, a face shield or something. It seems like on the synthetic bio world, there's a ton of people who are just jumping in and going, yeah, actually I normally do cancer, but I can, I can do this thing, or I, I normally do this or this, but it feels like there's a lot of fragmentary, uh, a fragmentation in the whole place because we don't have a, there's no, there's no like Android operating system for, for designing, testing, producing, and, and, and making sure life is life and works. Um, it, it's still kind of fragmented, but you you are the co-lead of the Human Genome 2.0 project. The first one was Read the Genome. That was pretty awesome, and that led to this incredible explosion, you know, a, a number of years ago. Now we can actually sequence this stuff so cheap, but your one is about the Genome Write project. It's about writing a genome. What does it mean to do that? And, and I've, I've got a little visual here on the, on the whiteboard that we talked about a little earlier today. I don't know if... Um, uh, so, so you've got this dream of sort of saying, look, what if we get a push button manufacturing for a genome foundry? And you've got this kind of idea of a, of a four phase plan going from viruses, which you've described as USB sticks, um, that just sort of plug into a cell and convince it to do something. The cell's the operating system to, you know, getting inside the nucleus of the cell itself and then actually developing new chromosomes. You've called it chromosome 24, um, which I think is kind of interesting, you know, this notion that that we might have an extra chromosome that's a programmable chromosome that could actually be able to give us uh, safety and security, have dip switches or something, be able to turn things on and off. Tell us a little bit about what you envision for, for sort of genome foundry one, genome foundry two, three, and four, what, what your whole vision is for this. Yeah, so just to back up the genome project, right, is, is as you said, it's kind of the other side of the coin of the human genome project, mm. which was uh, the, the largest life science effort ever done in, in the public domain. Um, and it was to, you know, for an international group to work together to read the first human genome. And that was incredibly successful, kick-started. Uh, it, it, it completed early and on budget, like uh, unlike most projects. That, uh, that are founded in government programs and academia. Um, and it has since led to this incredible explosion of biotechnologies and our ability to read the genomes of all living things. But what I thought was missing was the ability to write in genomes where, and that's where things get creative. And we, in fact, we've been doing this for a while. Um, the first genome that was synthesized was actually 2002. And that was a virus. Um, and in 2010, the first cellular genome was written. Um, it, it, but it's still early days. I think we were, as we were talking earlier, there's only been about 50 genomes that have been made synthetically um, from scratch. But my, uh, my intention with the Genome Project Right was to essentially set the bar really high and, and create this, this pull and of interest to for people to start writing genomes. And so if you say you're gonna go, at the time they were, the meeting I was at where I proposed this, the, the group of scientists were synthesizing the yeast genome, which is about 11 million bits of genetic code. Um, and yeast 
is actually a really great model of organism for understanding. So wait, before you go yeah. too far, yeah. you just said the yeast is 11 million. I want to catch 11 million bits or base pairs or bits or base pairs. I use those okay. those Got it. synonymously. So I want to go back to my drawing for a second. Maybe you could pull yeah. it up, Omid, and have uh, it aside here. Um, so, so yeast is, I just drew a piece of bread. I don't know. That's the best I could come up with. So yeast is 11 million base pairs, right? Yeah. So it's sort of kilobits or something like that. Um, how big is a virus? Like, uh, well, there's kind of, a, you know, viruses range in size from being as small as 3000 bits, uh, hmm. to, to a couple million bits, but those are really outliers. Uh, most yeah. human viruses, uh, tend to be in, uh, relatively small, so between mm -hmm. 10,000 bits and let's call it 50,000 bits. Um, it. There's, uh, the, the reason why human viruses tend to be small is because we have a lot of physical defenses that prevent mm -hmm. the virus from going very far into our bodies. Um, mm -hmm. uh, to give you an example, SARS-CoV-2 is about 29,800 bits. So oh, it, it's okay. about in the middle of that range. Right around there, yeah. Okay. And because it's a respiratory virus, you breathe it in and it finds cells to infect. But So to get a sense of the scale here, though, your first, your first foundry, you want to you be able to basically have a push button um, and have this ability to sort of push a button and, and, and it does mostly in software. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what the first one is versus the second and why you want to do the first one first all the way up to the full genome. Well, what I'm particularly interested in is digitizing this entire process because mm -hmm. when you, right now we don't, we, we manipulate the genomes of organisms using software tools. So we're all, mm -hmm. we all have a laptop or a computer or a phone even that, you know, gives us the ability to, to manipulate a genome. What I'd like to be able to do is is really grease the wheels of then turning that DNA into mm. the organism itself. I'm only I'm particularly interested in the writing of complete genomes that mm. that define the organism. So right now, economically, the technologies for writing and assembly, like it's synthesizing and assembling DNA. Um, are still kind of in the first or second generation at best, um, and and they're still um, they're still quite expensive. We pay per character per bit when we mm. write DNA, um, and it's it's approximately just for rounding. Let's just call it uh, ten cents a bit. It, mm. It's a little bit cheaper um, uh, if you're in, in some situations, but. That if you're if you're stringing together a ten thousand base pair virus um, at ten cents a bit, you're spending a thousand dollars to write that genome from scratch, and wow. and okay. yeah. so that's so right now with the current technology for synthesizing and assembling DNA, we can only really build viruses. Um, uh, as, as a life form from scratch. Uh, we, we have demonstrated that we can build a bacterium, but mm. a bacterial genome, um, the smallest are about 500,000 base pairs. Um, so that's, that gets to be pretty expensive if, if you're synthesizing. And something like E. coli, which is uh, you know, one of the most well-known bacteria because it's the main bacterial component of our, of our intestines. Um, that has about a four and a half million base pair genome. So again, if if we were to synthesize it, you know, even and give us a sense yeah. for what becomes possible here. When we were talking earlier, you were pointing. I mean, my first question was, if more people are writing these things, doesn't that create a bio risk? And you're like, no, because then more people will improve and pick up, perhaps help build an immune system, but what are the kinds of improvements that we'll see as this happen? And Steve, you should come in here because I think you've both been investing in these kinds of yep. things. You sit here at the, you know, right at the border between uh, the digital code and, and, and bio code and also the regulatory issue. So um, maybe from both of you, what this makes possible and Steve as kind of a person thinking out there in the future investing, the timing. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll just say that the push button genomes are definitely the inevitable future um, uh, because I, if there's one thing I can absolutely count on, 
It's that the cost of synthesizing and assembling DNA is going to get substantially cheaper, just like the cost of reading DNA got uh, even out accelerated Moore's law. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, and I, 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 I can pretty much guarantee this because the equipment for writing complex genomes is in, is in the cells. Like every time a human cell divides, it, it basically has to write a human genome perfectly uh, you know, for the cell to, to, to make a daughter. And, and so I know that the equipment for writing full genomes, even complex genomes like our own, but plants and other animals as well, uh, just needs to be harnessed. And I think we're getting there. And what does that open up? It just opens up being able to design the metabolism of a cell completely with, with more and more specificity. Uh, today, it also is allowing the creation of subcellular components like proteins and enzymes and structural materials. Uh, but it, uh, and then the smallest genomes, viruses, as again, uh, I've described them as USB sticks, a way to load programs. We're going to get really, really good at being able to program viruses for, to do positive things. We've harnessed them, you know, for vaccines and gene therapies, et cetera. But now we're going to have atomically precise viruses. Okay, you mentioned one uh, using phages to build batteries. What are some of the things, uh, either of you, in the next 10, 15, few years, that the manufacturing of these things will make life better? Oh, it'll be everything. <laughs> 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 Chemicals, nutraceuticals, food. Um, you, when you build things with atomic precision uh, in the biological domain, you start with all the areas where we interface with that. So these are organic three-dimensional structures, right? Food we care about, drugs we care about, things that interface with our biology. But these materials can also be designed to attach to inorganic services, has been shown for a number of years in a number of ways, and computationally designed. So you could build things that bind to inorganics to make better solar cells, better batteries. Uh, just this morning, for example, I heard from a company, Sensei, that's using phage display to produce the proteins specifically the four proteins for COVID that you want to generate immune response. And the beautiful thing about these little bacteriophages, you think of them as little like lunar landers with a capsid and the little legs hanging down, is that when you display the proteins, um, well, first you use bacteria as you manufacturing, you infect them, they pop out, you get tons more. And they make all these proteins, but the, 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 bacteria, excuse me, the virus itself is the adjuvant. It's the thing that triggers the immune system to say, hey, this is a virus, this is a bacteriophage. And then, oh, it's got all these COVID proteins on it. So the immune system has this beautiful response, it, just, just circling it back to what you can do in, in times, of, um, times of cholera uh, with loving of the bug. Um, but no, this, I think we are in, just in a high level, and I'll head it back to Andrew. We're in a renaissance of learning about the information systems of biology. We're able to, we were able to read the code of life, as he pointed out. Now we're able to write the code of life. Actually, I was on the board of the company that did all those genome synthesis projects he just mentioned, from the virus to mycoplasma, you know, building the first synthetic life form, you know, whose parents were a computer, just weird, mind-bending stuff. But the business applications right now are more in the snippets, something you insert an otherwise interesting piece of biological code, whether it's a virus at the small scale or something that you insert you know, with cut and paste tools now with, with uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and other tool sets that rather than random hopes to, you know, like, oh, like building things with boxing gloves on where you're working with Legos, you now can actually cut and paste with the precision of an author and you can borrow from the pages of the Book of Life all over the place through shotgun sequencing of ecosystems. You have all these great bits of code Mm -hmm. We can get more into the right. code side of this. That's right. And and in fact, I, I think Andrew, you were talking about how in your Fab One, what you're trying to do is open this up so that you can do a lot more with the viruses without even having to put it in a petri dish. You can. There's actually a lot of physics you can do to actually do QA, you know, qual quality control and and things like that. So say a little bit more about sort of the leaps that you have seen small labs do. George Church's lab or something like that, but how do we democratize it? How do we actually open this up for, for uh, really a biological century in terms of um, innovation? I, I believe it's gonna come down to making biofactories or what they call foundries. Mm. Um, mm. And that's because right now, if you look at biology, it's really cellular, it's really fragmented. Uh, there, there are labs around the world, every university, every institution, many companies, um, and, and 
if you if you, they they kind of remind me of the very early days of computers where you had a room sized computer and and each one of them were bespoke and and that's how you did your work and so there's all these there's all these brilliant bioengineers but they're all working with their own systems their own tools their own reagents their own people and nothing mm. is standardized nothing ah, is standardized. interesting and and what we've seen with the advent of synthetic biology and companies like ginkgo bioworks and craig venter's companies is we're we're seeing an investment in robotic architectures that mm. do the the manual manipulations keep better records, are really standards-based, high throughput, and it is really making it like a factory. So most mm. of the companies today that in synthetic biology are building platforms that mm. really accelerate and, and improve the quality of, of R&D. Where I think it's going though, so, uh, and again, what, what I've tried to do for, for a number of years is say, okay, well, let's take that approach. We need a factory. But rather, if it's once the cost of building that factory drops to a certain point, it doesn't have to be a private factory. It, you can mm -hmm. now make it more of an open factory, an open foundation. And then you can start to, you know, they often say, well, the smartest people in the world, you know, aren't necessarily in your company. They're, they're all over. I'd like to start concentrating the knowledge of life science into these factories so so because everyone's got a pet virus or a pet cell that they've been you know working with for years <laughs> Wait, you know, like, let's let's get that knowledge. Knowledge. Yeah. everyone has a yeah. pet virus everyone yeah. has a pet virus it, it's true though. wait like, wait you the yeah. last time we talked to you you know or one of the times we talked to you, you just held up a virus that you had sequenced to help cure ah. uh, cancer in a canine that you had done with a oh. with a CAD tool, basically. I don't know if you still have that well, around your well, house. Well, so I was, you know, I was very fortunate. You know, we we met at Autodesk, but Autodesk yeah. is a company that makes CAD tools, computer aided design tools, and I I kind of twisted and nudged them to say, well, let's make some design tools for biology, and and let's kind of take a printer uh, outside of the company, they were big in 3d printing and let's, let's mm. do the biological printing at a different facility, but make it robotic. Mm. And, and we were successful prototyping that we had a CAD tool for making a virus, the, mm. com the compilation turning digital DNA into molecular DNA was done by a third party. And then the, the molecular DNA was handed off to a robotic lab one of these, uh, which is the way apps. to think about this is think of a yeah. cloud, a cloud of a cloud. shipping containers with robots inside dipping and dunking yeah. and cloning the cancer and cloning the well, virus. Well, in this case, kill it is an example. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, they were booting up the virus and demonstrating mm -hmm. that it was functional. Um, mm -hmm. And and in fact, so we did that with a with a harmless virus called Phi X one seven four. Um, and just, uh, it was fun. And then we took it a step further and we made the world's first synthetic cancer fighting virus. It was a virus designed um, to give a cancer cell a flu. Um, and we were working with a, with a veterinary scientist to make a, essentially a, a, a virus for dog cancers. And that uh, was incredible fun. And now we took that knowledge. And since I left Autodesk, we've built a, a, a factory for, the, for one virus that we mm -hmm. can now re-engineer in a really short time frame and, and even do things like target it to a particular cancer. So if you think is, of a virus as really a USB stick, then it's kind yeah. of got an app on it that happened to be like give a flu to a cancer app. Yeah. And the, the operating system was the, the dog's actual cells. The dog cells, and, yeah. and now you just brought in uh, the, 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 one of the founders of Shapeways, which was the kind of massive distributed, um, uh, I guess, I guess uh, service bureau to be able to 3D print things out of gold or silver or platinum or metal. Uh, and he's helping you build this kind of uh, app store for synthetic bio. It feels like there's that part of it, but then the other part of this genome thing, your foundries is all about uh, the operating system itself. We're pretty far away from generating a completely synthetic chromosome. No, like, well, it depends well, on the chromosome you're talking about. So a oh, virus has a chromosome too. Uh, okay. And and we can print those. Uh, we've already demonstrated. Um, you know, Craig Venter made the first synthetic bacterial chromosome, uh, and mm -hmm. that was 2010. It's already been a decade. Um, yeah. The most nice. recent bacterial chromosome to be synthesized was E. coli, done last mm -hmm. year, um, which was a, a significant accomplishment because it's about a, a four million base pair genome. 
But as the cost of synthesizing a bacterial genome falls, um, mm. today, if you were to synthesize the E. coli genome from scratch, it would probably be somewhere between a half million and a million dollars if you put mm. in an order to the current companies. But now yeah. imagine a, a, a cheap, a better synthesizer, yep. and, yeah, now it's, and now it's and now it's five hundred dollars. Yeah, and the price yeah. is yeah. coming down rapidly. It, oh, yeah. It, it's been going down more rapidly than Moore's Law. There's like Carlson's curve to that effect. And Gen no, 9, a, com a oh. company I was involved with, the Ginkgo Bot, is yeah. easily under a penny, a base pair. It's just not you know available to others quite yet. Um, yeah. But they were well, in, the, in the midst of commercializing that. Yeah, and, and right now it's actually very cheap to synthesize small amounts of DNA, mm -hmm. but if you have to assemble it into a genome size, uh, that that's where the real cost is, and that's where you need more validation steps. But but the technology like will just, to, just to put this yeah. in in perspective for for our listeners, though, um, you've got 50 kilobits as a virus. It's a it's a it's a USB stick. Um, yeast or E. coli might be in the four million bit range, um, and then a chromosome is 50 million. Might be but, like if you went with the smallest one, the maybe. Hmm. And then why the, the the smallest or, human mean, chromosome human yes. donor yeah. is fifty million, and then a full genome for like an animal or something like that, like or a dog and my little doodle, um, is more like three billion kilobits. Yeah. So that's the leap that we're seeing, and and I think we are counting on both Moore's law, but also this sort of volumetric law of of nature. And we've got a we've got an instruction manual sitting outside our house, um, in some ways, and so that's it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, I think I, oh, I think that the next generation, I think the improvements in synthesis and assembly technology will supercharge biotechnology because a lot of the yeah. monkey work in genomics will just become a print job. Um, yeah. And that and as the economic barrier and technical barriers fall, I think we'll see an explosion of creativity. But again, I, I want to stress part of my thinking is, you know, we kind of have to cross this this chasm of viruses, um, mm. which are the smallest genomes to synthesize and clearly uh, the most disruptive to humanity yeah. um, in many ways. And so I think we have to really start thinking about biosecurity and biosafety in, mm. in this new synthetic context in a way that we haven't done before. So that's, what, that's the mm. silver lining for me with COVID. This, mm. is kind of a, uh, this is kind of a training pandemic. And, and it gives us the opportunity to rethink the entire architecture and, uh, of, of how we detect these nanoparticles and how we can uh, defend ourselves against them. But also you as we start to engineer them, how we, how we do the forensics. And well, and you mentioned that we don't even have a radar network. Like in, at least in World uh -huh. War II, we had a radar. Um, and you mentioned <laughs> Roswell Biotech or something. I don't know, I'd never heard of them, but they have a chip, I guess that has proteins on the chips and they've got like millions on a chip scale that can just, when a thing floats by, it can detect it, not being used today for, for the radar network for us, but that could be built into everything, that kind of a, a radar network. We have to wait until ICU beds or coffins start rolling out before we know what's happening today. So, so we're kind of fighting this alien World War III without knowing it. So you mentioned that, world, that, that viruses, which are like a, a blank word document in size, and then full genomes are like the maybe the third rail because that that worries people about like designer babies. Those are the two kind of most dangerous, and they're they're, they're the extremes of your fabs. You know, sort of the virus stuff, and then the full genome stuff. Um, but if we don't solve this, we're never going to get to the other side. Yeah, it I, turns out that the most provo oh, sorry, uh, I don't mean to step on anyone. Uh, it turns out that the most provocative genomes to engineer are the small ones, viruses, and the and then the human genome, and kind of everything mm -hmm. in between there's just not that much interest in, uh, at least today. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's where the real opportunities come. So, so I'd love to yeah. just push it on this question of the connection of a genome to sensing, or as Ann Greenberg said in a question to us, mashing edge computing with synthetic biology to do continual monitoring and testing. Because if there's one thing we've seen in this, um, it's an enormous information deficit, right? Where uh, it, takes, it takes a while to develop testing, the testing isn't real time. If you were actually able to pick up where viruses were in real time, you could understand how you should distance what you're doing. I mean, it'd be amazing if you actually mm -hmm. knew what was going on. You probably wouldn't, you'd have minor effects in the economy because it would only be around the very few people who had it. We don't have that, so a lot of stuff's got destroyed. So I'm wondering how that frontier plays out 
both the technical portion of general medicine testing, and then maybe Steve, you have some mm -hmm. thoughts on the practical IT issues of how we actually deploy that in perhaps the Apple Google uh, uh, contact testing me mechanism and some of the uh, regulatory and uh, ethical issues our industry is facing <laughs> as we attempt to do that. Oh boy. Oh boy. No, no, like, no, 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 did you want Andrew to start on? Yeah, so two things. One is let's let's just. I'm just kind of interested in this. What's possible when you bring these together and we can do a better job? Uh, just back up to the reality of where we are. Well, Peter, though, but your point, the, the question that, that was flashed up said edge computing and synthetic yeah. bio, right? right. And uh, what Andrew, had, I think Andrew, you just filed an interesting um, patent or, or or something in this space. Can you talk about that or not? Uh, well, let me just let me just back up and answer your question, then I'll I'll touch on yeah. the IP. Um, uh, I think that the most powerful diagnostic tool that we have in general is just being able to read the code of the organisms around us. So the generalized test equipment is, is a better sequencer that can just pluck the any virus particles that happen to be floating by and and look at the code level of what that particle is. Um, Given the advances that we've done in DNA sequencing, uh, and and Steve, you use the term molecular electronics. I think that's really the the incredible field for people to get into today. Mm. It's literally the connection of electronics and biology in in real time. Biology is always a little squishy and and flexible, but the electronics are incredibly precise and robust, and that intersection is amazing. Um, to that end, there are companies today that are using molecular electronics for a variety of different processes, both application development and development of core technologies, including things like DNA uh, sequencing. Um, the the patent I filed, and I, I'm 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 not a big patent guy. I, I tend to like the software world where it's a little more flexible. Um, but uh, if you're building hardware, you really need to think. Patents. I filed one patent in the last 15 years, and it was for a new type of DNA synthesizer that is based on molecular electronics. And uh, it, it's more so that, you know, I see the future coming of where we'll be able to write uh, potentially millions of small genomes in, in a few minutes using this type of, of technology. Today, it's being used for being able to sequence uh, genomes in minutes. Um, but uh, like, uh, this is such an exciting time to be working down at the nanoscale, both with semiconductor based systems and with biology, which is kind of really powerful nanotechnology with a programming language that's becoming easier and easier to access. Yeah, did you want me to um, pick up on that? I, so, this idea of the edge and in bio, um, so the synthetic genomics, Kirk Venner's company, um, it, it was mentioned, is doing a bioprinter. It's a remote like, desktop genetic printer. And they've shown with DARPA and others that you can, you know, find a virus somewhere and, you know, you know, wherever it emerges, you know, beam the data, of course, you know, not to physically ship samples and start generating, um, you know, both, you know, antibody therapies and vaccines remotely. The challenge uh, and then the risk at the same time is now you're distributing and democratizing the ability to create um, weapons of mass destruction. And this is the other, uh, you know, sort of mega theme of the uh, of the last century is that that's the inexorable trend that we're moving to an area where individuals with a little bit of background could, you know, do mm. great harm. We uh, There was a mention of this sort of being a trainer pandemic at the beginning, and I think that's uh, true uh, in more than one way. The, the way that jumps the most to mind is in terms of our uh, systemic and societal responses. Um, the societal immune system, if you will, versus the individual uh, biological immune system. And we found to be woefully wanting. Um, there were, uh, you know, by Larry Brilliant and others, techniques that the TED Prize funded to detect early what's going on in the field so you can detect biologically. It's sort of um, normally released and normally evolving kinds of pathogens. Um, that was shut down just prior to this pandemic. Then you have, of course, the much greater specter of a bioengineered uh, weapon. Right? So remember that, that smallpox has killed a billion humans in an aggregate total. And there's like a deity in the Hindu religion, Shatala, named after this, this incredible pox on humanity. And when we talked about animal agriculture, whenever you have dense people, animals, mm. what have you, you have pathogens that naturally crop up to take them out. It's like nature abhors a concentration, I would say, the, the opposite of a, of a vacuum, if you will, from the physics domain. And so it would be great if we had detection modalities. It's not just a better sensor, it's, it's the human systems for deploying them in the right places, taking action. Uh -huh. What is 
What is your quarantine policy if you find interleukin-4 splicing the smallpox, right? So smallpox alone might be, oh, that's pretty bad. We have some immunity, but interleukin-4 spliced into it, well, shoot, within mice, that kills like almost all of them. In the vaccinated mice, it kills 30% of them. So imagine your, mm. your death rate after a vaccine is 30%. Think about how that would change the current pandemic. Um, mm. Healthcare workers wouldn't go to work. Doctors wouldn't do their job. People would flee everything. It'd just be a nightmare. So um, I think, but in some yeah, ways, I don't want to sound like a down owner, but like we are cutting our teeth on this on the bio world and a it is a trigger. precursor yeah. like I, like this is why i don't worry about ai or nanotech taking over the world because we'll cut our teeth on bio threats long before we even have those threats and we got to figure out what we're going to do about it and and yet i mean you just mentioned what is what's our policy on this and what's going on it seems like so much of these things are moving faster than any regulator policy regime that's in yeah. place right now yeah. Um, you know, are we going to yeah. end up needing? Yeah, I mean, I got to say, know, the, the FDA, I, I, need, learned this, need? I learned some of this this morning. The FDA may claim they're doing fast track of stuff, but they're mm -hmm. they are captured by cronyism as they always would have been. And, and, and it's just insane, actually, how hard it is to get a new vaccine, to get any feedback, right, on a new modality. And there's some great modalities, computational approaches, phage-based approaches. There's hundreds of really creative ways to test out vaccines, but because of the downside risk, which is, visible as an FDA failure versus the upside potential, which is less visible. Like, did you approve something faster, right? No one's judging the FDA in that. They're judging them on the occasional mistake they got through. And so it's gonna be very difficult for them to change. I mean, this kind of raises the general issue of, um, we, we've built governance systems to be deliberate and slow. And we live in a world of, of exponential changes, including things like this popping up. And then we also have this kind of, for whatever political or uh, uh, kind of psychic reasons, this kind of anti-science haze or this questioning of vaccine haze going on. And it, it sounds like all this stuff holds us back or there's great possibility, but there is there isn't as much will for it. And, it, it. and, you know, we live in an era where kind of because of climate change and the nature of employment, it's a little bit of a downer. And yet, I think back to when I was a kid and people were excited about the space age, they're excited about computing, they're excited about new sets of technology. And I'm just, I'm wondering if either of you come up against, um, you know, is, is it just cronyism that's holding us back? Is it a lack of appreciation of these things? I guess I'm asking more of kind of a political and media kind of question of uh, 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 what, what are the mechanisms that, that we can overcome this stuff or speed, speed this stuff up because, uh, uh, what we've identified is these are the right technologies and the important places to speed up the innovation cycle, but we have artificial mechanisms that we may need to move beyond. Well, did you get the question out of that? Yeah, I, here's, here's the way I've approached it personally um, as, as a way to accelerate. There's some people that are much better prepared than me to go and create change in regulatory regimes um, uh, I, uh, over a decade ago, I sat down and thought, well, what can I do as an individual, um, you know, without a big pharma company, not even being affiliated with the university because I, I have been independent for a long time. How could I create change? And then I realized if I can't win in the current system because it's so expensive and so onerous, why not change the system? And, and so... I started to focus on, can I build a platform that would allow me to make a real and powerful therapeutic for one person at a time? Uh, because you can't do a, mm -hmm. a physical, you can't do a, a clinical trial, a phase clinical trial for, mm -hmm. you know, for, for one person. It's <laughs> it's so this is sort of n equals one n equals here. one it's designed for you yeah. it's watermarked that it only works with your denim it's it's built within the design tool is yeah, that where you're going with this, this sort of so that's why i focused on building a platform hmm. to to design and build viruses uh because they were they were within reach of the current tools, but also mm. I could build a virus therapeutic, whether you know, it was a cancer fighting virus or, mm. uh, or a gene therapy, I could build it with this platform for one person. And, and I felt that the, the challenge of getting an approval from a regulatory agency was within reach because I could get that approval 
you know, in general for the platform, but in specifically for for use with a single person, um, even just around compassionate use. Uh, you know, all other all other pharmaceutical approaches have been exhausted, and and so that to me was the reasonable way to start opening this up. Now, vaccines are actually some of the most complex uh, drugs to get approved because they're preventative. They're you're you're trying to prevent a disease. And and you're, it's going to go into basically everyone, you know, uh, and so th that has a very high bar. But if you're talking about building a therapeutic for a child that that has a genetic disorder where there is no drug available, or or a cancer patient that has used every possible treatment and and is now uh, is now being overcome by their cancer, the, those are are n of one possibilities. That's that, very clever that, because you you are rooting or you are routing around all of the resistance mechanisms or kind of institutional um, uh, friction that would stop that because the, that's all designed for mass kind of stuff. Plus, you're going right mm -hmm. into very interesting success stories, right? So that's kind of a clever way for you in this case, you the pathogen to route around the regulatory structure to to survive and come up with something cool. I like that because uh, that plus education works, and then you don't have to take on the whole ball of wax. Yeah, and you can still build a very robust process, very regulated with all the security features, etc. It's just, it's, it's much more like a 3D printing paradigm. And which is why, you know, as you mentioned, Mickey, my, the CEO of, of the company, and, and he came on board as a co-founder, um, his experience was building 3D printing as a, as a service. And now we're just, now we're just printing a, a molecular you know, but, but, but if I understand correctly, like right now, though, mm -hmm. there are some private companies that are doing amazing things. You've got Ginkgo, you've got Twist, you've got other things. But but not nobody particularly is focusing on, OK, an end to end supply chain all the way up to a human genome that actually has code review built in that has sort know. of check in, check out and things. That uh, no, I well, yeah. Tell me, Steve. What, well, we I mean, there's some there's, there's some code review in the sense that from for a bio threat perspective, nothing yeah, that comes out of the bioprinter. Yeah. You can't just like print smallpox backwards and like you know sneak it through. But no, that no, might, no. That yeah, might be a no. cat and mouse game. Yeah. Um, I meant more you, like the, the tracking all on. the things we have with software that that are kind of like well mature about kind of understanding the evolution of software code and how it branches mm -hmm. and things. But I maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. wrong. I personally don't think that's the oh. bottleneck because the complex oh, system so far exceeds human understanding that it's not for want of design tools or coordination mm. between agents. I think it's a process modality of how we build complex ah, systems. Do we evolve them? Do you know? Do we understand how we're interacting with the human body and our immune system and what have you? So it's not. Um, I don't mm. think it's like 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 if you looked at a digital challenge in software and said, well, we're doing purposeful design. We understand the software artifacts we build. How can we scale human ingenuity so that teams can build products and we can have collaboration? And that's the entire history of you know yeah. everything from object oriented software frameworks to you know middleware and what have you. In the biological domain, you quickly hit a barrier of understanding. Or like you humans either, might not ever be able to understand. Well, exactly. We'll never understand our brain. Yeah. We'll create an kind of like we can't brain. understand our children, yeah. I think. Exactly. But we'll create intelligences like children and AIs long before yeah. we understand how they work in the inner. So you so, have a thesis that yeah. this is almost like raising a child or, or parenting. Uh, I think it's an engineering reality of the future will be more like parenting than programming, and it'll be more hmm. like uh, directed evolution than intelligent design. But one thing uh, I definitely want to mention, bouncing off Andrew, we're talking about 3D printers and uh, routing around, uh, or at least trying to get through the FDA morass quicker, and doing so um, digitally is our most recent investment. Prelis Bio is doing all that. They they take yeah. the COVID virus, they they literally 3D print human immune um, lymph nodes, right? The equivalent mm -hmm. of your lymph nodes. Ah, this is the lymph node, yeah. Immune yeah. T cells much more rapidly by basically externalizing the immune system. And they've already got 300 antibodies, human antibodies, yeah. which as a therapy, unlike a vaccine, you can't overdose on. You can take as much of that as you want. You can take 10 times as many as you need and it won't hurt you. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that that'll be a faster regulatory path to mm -hmm. hit all those points. But it is sad that personalized medicine, regenerative medicine, cellular therapies are asking the FDA to shift from, oh, there's a drug, there's a small molecule I can approve or disapprove to a process. How are you going to make that cellular therapy? What is your CAR T process? Are you going to extend yeah. the telomeres of your cells that you're mortalizing in your petri dish before you put them back in the human? Ooh, what you know? How do I get my head around that when every patient's therapy is different? Every single one. Oh, the yeah. next one. Right? It's not a thing. It's a process. So it, that, mm. that's why they say they need to be re-engineered. And I don't know if the crisis, unfortunately, this time around, 
was bad enough to get them to change really anything. Um, hmm. I hope I hope they will. Hmm. Yeah, no, good point. Them, like, inherit change, like coming out of this, that we have a more efficient FDA. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, you know, it's amazing, Mick, how so many of these conversations come back to being prepared to live in a world of complex systems or, or, or complexity and uncertainty. Uh, um, as we kind of got into this, Steve, we realized more and more that we took inspiration from all the work going on at the Santa Fe Institute, yeah. uh, which, by the way, has published prodigiously in all of this, because yep. the, the very fact that the, here you have the scientific process every week learning new stuff, and then it's changing its opinion about what works or what to try, and to the public, this looks like people don't know what they're doing, or then creates the you know political stuff, we'll see they were stupid, but in fact, it's just... As Kevin Kelly told us, probably on our fourth show, it is it is science working far faster uh, than mm. than we're used to, and you know not and and not in time to build a consensus while all of the eyes are on it. And now what we're describing here is we're designing we're designing for complexity, but we still have regulatory systems that are based very much in the product world. And we're in this across the board. We just see that we're in this in this phase change. And the whole conceit of this show was kind of this. Change is happening, and I mean, uh, even this very episode was in three acts, right? There was this first act where everybody shocked and went home, and how do we social distance, and how will we deal with this? And if you look at the first couple of weeks of quarantine, everyone's like, well, this is strange. We're all at home. What do we do, and who do we talk to? And then mm -hmm. the second phase was when we come out, it won't be normal, and will downtowns be there, and will restaurants be there, and we're all going to work at home, and oh, we're suddenly looking at this inequality, all this stuff that we've seen. And then when we look out slightly further in this five to 50-year time frame, we realize the framing in which we look at stuff has to change. And then what's annoying is um, we're politically divided. So like, how would you bring that up without getting yelled at? Uh, but that's actually next week's show. So we don't have to solve that one right now. Um, I do <laughs> want to point out that it's 525. Um, yeah. we, as everyone who's ever watched this show knows, this is a one hour show that generally goes to about an hour and a half or so. So <laughs> this is the point at which we say, if you have other commitments because it's a Friday night over Memorial Day weekend, whatever that means these days, people are, are free to go. And we can continue. And a reminder that when we're back on Wednesday, the show will be building the world of tomorrow together. Um, a week ago Wednesday, when we when we had uh, 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 Lise on from Minerva University, and what was the name of the guy from? And Martin Reeves from BCG. Martin Reeves, yeah. Martin, who's a management expert who was talking about how we're moving towards the system thinking. And then we had a recent graduate from Minerva University. And where we ended up was we needed to get her and her friends from around the world together to kind of, how would you collaboratively work, build solutions, actually, you know, aggregate prizes and 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 collaborate on building what's next, right? Then, then we had last Friday's show where we looked at all sorts of mechanisms that were bringing together um, online forums and entertainment and entertainers and, and you know, bringing entertainers into 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 Fortnite, world of warcraft to kind of build global audiences and today we're talking about technology next week we're going to get down to the business of how do we actually build kind of a global workforce on this and we're going to have a number of of uh, of guests who have been working that and working platforms for that so that's but that's that's coming any I, I, andrew or steve any last um last words last comment something we didn't ask you which you wish we did hmm. Oh, uh, Steve, Steve you need to go far. off of mute yeah. Uh, yeah. because these voices, these scientific voices are important right now. I know you want to read my lips. Like how, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can't read my lips like how. I, you know, I think I should say something a little more uplifting, you know, after the downer of, you know, the golden age of viruses and pandemics. Um, and that is that we also in an incredible renaissance of opportunity. And these these ways in which we do engineering, this this whether it's deep learning, machine learning, whether it's generative design coming out of Autodesk, whether it's genetic programming or even directed evolution, high throughput experimentation, biological evolution, all of these have in common that they are iterative algorithms that allow you to compound complexity um, that transcend the antecedents. In other words, you can create, they're the only way we've ever been able to create something more complex than that which created it, right? The only way a human has created something beyond human understanding, the only way that we can engineer it in a way that transcends our own limits. So in my mind, it's the only way, again, looking at 50 years, that you would get to you know, an AI worth you know, considering intelligent. The only way you get to designing biological systems that perhaps are robust and resilient and don't run amok within our information systems biology. And, and increasingly, as we do, as we've knocked off all the easy problems, most engineering 
most software is generated by a machine, meaning it's one of these iterative algorithms, like 90% of all software generated at Google is through a deep learning like methodology that is not a human creating something of purposeful design, something they can understand, something they can prove is safe. Some, it's fast, cheap, and out of control back in the old Rodney Brooks sense. So while it can seem scary, it's also the inevitable future. It's the way most complex systems will be built. We will trust our lives to it every day if we drive an autonomous car or go on an airplane flight because the majority of your flight is driven by a machine. Um, that is our future. And the questions that it begs on a regulatory front um, are definitely worth asking, but you statistically can show that there's a better way of doing everything. There'll be safer cars, we'll have better therapies, uh, we'll have personalized therapies, and again, we have to shift the locus of learning um, as humans, as agents of change, from the things we try to make to the process of creation itself. And if we focus all of our learning, how can we create better? How can we be a better parent? How can we create a better AI? How can we grow a better virus? Um, how can we iterate with our immune system in a more productive way? That's where the future lies. And I think it's no better time to be a student of these uh, subjects. Hmm. I, I'll pick up on that, Steve, because uh, again, you've been at the forefront of so many of these technologies so early because of the way you, your curiosity and, and I think joy in exploring the fringes. Um, the thing that has really, uh, has, has has become part of me now uh, with my time at Autodesk was just appreciating how much of the world is manufactured, how much it takes effort and and really sophisticated tools to manufacture the world around us. And and what I absolutely love is is biology is the most sophisticated form of manufacturing. Uh, Self assembly is is magical. Uh, particularly when you're building it from uh, from elemental materials, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. Um, so, so the fact that we are now getting um, the right software tools again, many of them will be AI based and and far uh, aggregate our human intelligence and processes uh, to be able to harness this this manufacturing platform called life to meet the needs of humanity, whether it's food, clean air, water, uh, medicines, uh, materials, I think is, is really remarkable. And so we're right on this cusp of now being able to, to start to program these printers. The, the, uh, the cell is a printer. And, and I think it's just gonna be a remarkable few, few decades as, we, as, as our knowledge concentrates and is used to train the software systems to, to direct these incredibly powerful manufacturing plants uh, that we call cells. And I, I just think it changes everything about this century. And, and if I, I, wish I, was, I wish I was 10 years old again so that I could start diving in and, and learning how to, how to program these systems uh, with, a, with a completely blank mind and no, no legacy, uh, baggage from from how I know how difficult it is to deal with regulatory and economic and other systems today that are that are just not up to the up to speed <laughs> but yeah um, teach a lot of kids and and I, I think that this is going to be just a, an amazing amazing few decades oh, uh, very nice hey Peter um, I just want to point out um, Omid can you pull up the whiteboard I just want to everyone might notice that this is this was our conversation today. Steve Jervitson talking a bit about kind of his thesis and what was going on, and the only way we're really going to transcend ourselves. We're talking about these sort of phases to get to actually whole genome engineering. Um, this is actually massive um, collaborative. Anybody can log into the Miro and be able to draw, add notes to it, and it and it pulls back and kind of has all of the episodes that we've ever had. Um, in here. So um, next week, we're going to actually invite you to join it and add some ideas. Uh, so um, thanks for joining. And I just thought it'd be fun to kind of say if you if anybody wants the sketch notes on it, um, click on that little button on our on our archive site. Back to you, Peter. The, boy, we could just go on and on. And, um, uh, you know, Steve, I could I could add questions about how startups are responding and also uh, where you stand and whether everybody's been working at home or going back to the office. Actually, let me just ask you that one question. Oh, okay. you're not, this is the overtime. You're just gonna go for another four hours. I'm just gonna, I, just <laughs> wanna, I would just love that, yeah, but just, I couldn't help myself. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes, Mickey, we can't help ourselves. Uh, 
where do you come out on this whole bit of are we being trained to work from home or are we going to go right back to the office because that's where creativity happens? Well, I think on the margin, some people, again, pushed past that activation energy, realized that A, these meetings work about 80% as good as in person without the commute. B, they start yeah. on time because people aren't waiting for everyone else to show up as often yeah. in the physical space. Um, there is a certain wisdom of crowds you lose when you're not bouncing ideas off in that sort of you know, small group setting. Um, I personally want to go back to my office because it's a space museum and I kind of like being there. Um, <laughs> but that's just me. I think a lot of people are thinking about dialing it back and looking at distributed work um, much more interestingly and then getting past the first hurdle of just recapitulating the office environment online but thinking about different ways of doing distributed work in written form that is better for introverts and better for you know eking productivity out of a larger group of people so i think there could be some again force people to change the behavior then they realize wait this is a better way of doing things speaking of space museums spacex is launching astronauts next week Woo wednesday i'm gonna be there you know? <laughs> awesome. all, right. Yeah, all right. So that that is Thank Wednesday. You, it's, are you? Is that, is that um, from? Is that from the where? From Canaveral. Yeah. From Canaveral. From Good. Pad thirty nine A, where Apollo eleven launched. Right. What um, time is the launch? Four thirty four p.m. Uh, East Coast time. That's okay. Well, maybe we'll check mm -hmm. in with you. Yeah, one thirty um, West Coast. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, maybe we'll check in with you and have it. He's not going to take our call if he's sitting in Cape Canaveral. Hell no. Nobody has. Nobody has. going to be really <laughs> excited. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you for taking us through to um, this great transition point. We're heading into Memorial Day weekend. What are the first phase of whatever we've been through has been? That's right. I mean, who even knows time anymore? Uh, Steve, what we've learned is on a micro basis, we're all on time because we live in a broadcast clock. Every meeting starts on the hour. On a broader case, this has been a liminal experience. We've all been thrown into this cauldron of change, and we don't even recognize, like, there is no time left. But you've helped us all frame this, both in the 50-year time frame and in the time frame of what we all have to do when we go back to work, whether we do it from home or from the office. And we will continue this on Wednesday in this uh, Building the World of Tomorrow. Uh, we'll have Dr. Panway Gibson. We'll have James Hanus, who's one of the great innovators and has been organizing global innovation communities. And Dan Mapes, who runs Versus, which is a, uh, a, a, a virtual world collaboration environment that's built on top of, of Unity. We're starting to think of what are global collaboration mechanisms where we can actually harness uh, all the crowd and all the energy that sees this opportunity and starts collectively working on it, almost as a force for science and a conspiracy for good versus, say, the more anti-science elements that are like kind of looking for leadership here. That comes next week as we begin the second season of quarantine. Just made that up. It's not. There's no season. We're in Blur's day. This is like. <laughs> weird. All right. I love it. It is a second season. Go. We're going to see a lot of changes. It's going to be huge. And uh, <laughs> and Mick, you and I will be back on Wednesday. Steve will be at Cape Canaveral, right. and Andrew, you'll be messing with the smallest structures on Earth, taking us to the future. Pet virus. I, I, I love that. the idea of exploring inner space. But, yeah. you know, outer space is oh, this is good. We so got many more rockets. Yeah. yeah, it's so much better. <laughs> and with that, with that incredible dynamic range at, at multiple orders of magnitude, <laughs> it is five thirty-six Pacific Quarantine. Time. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next week. Also, thank you to Drew Youngs, who has created. We have mm. to acknowledge Drew at the end of our broadcast. Mm. Created our theme music, uh, and has styled uh, what what Steve Jervison points out is absurdly positive music built to a big band styling to remind us that it's, it's going to be bigger and brasher tomorrow. It's sort of a 50s throwback jingle, I think, which is nice. Yeah. It, it was specifically styled to be that. <laughs> okay, Omid, take Thanks. us out. Thanks, everybody. Let's get close, but not so close. Distance for a time. You know we want to see each other. You'll have to stay in your own time space while we draw.